the scenario is it yes peter visible now uh, one second yes yes i lost you <laughs> oh there we go i was trying to have a look at the powerpoint i'm not a great powerpoint uh, master so just so you know oh, that's all right I'll just read out the instruction in some time, once again, as we get ourselves connected to YouTube. And then we we'll go, as I have shared the program flow, we'll be going ahead like this. Okay, so I once again read out the instructions now. Yeah? So, good morning, everyone. We welcome you all to the one day online multidisciplinary international conference titled Contemporary Trends in Humanities, Commerce, Basic and Applied Sciences, and Charting Sustainable Development, organized by Internal Quality Assurance Cell of Parley Tilak Vitala Association's ML Dhankar College of Commerce. Before we proceed, I request you all to kindly take note of the following uh, that uh, following instructions that you may write your comments in the chat box. And you may ask the queries at the end of the session to our resource persons, and we'll be taking it forward to the resource person. And a feedback form will be circulated towards the end of the program. Kindly fill it carefully and submit it. Uh, at the end of the session, this will ensure your participation and attendance for the day. Wish you all uh, a rewarding sessions and enriching learning experience. So, as we go ahead to begin with, once again, welcome you all. I, uh, Somnath Ramin Ramesh Mukhya, Assistant Professor, Department of English, extend a very warm and hearty welcome to one and all present here for a one-day online multidisciplinary uh, international conference titled Contemporary Trends in Humanities, uh, Commerce, Basic and Applied Sciences, and Charting Sustainable Development, organized by the Internal Quality Assurance Cell of Parletila Vidalaya Associations and Udhanapur College of Commerce, Mumbai. Uh, as the sole uplifting verse uh, goes from Brihadaran Punashada, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, Sarve Santu Naramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pushantu, Ma Kashchit Dukha Bhagavad. Which means that not only the regions, waters, plants, trees, natural laws, and energies, but may all the creatures live in harmony and peace. Peace should remain everywhere. This, in a way, encapsulates the theme of this. Uh, online multidisciplinary international conference. Uh, as I reflect on the process of the planning and preparation and the mode of brainstorming of the conference, I extend my deepest gratitude to our parent body, Parlitilak Vidalai Association for their sustained support. Our principal who lead by example, Dr. D.M. Doke, who mentored us through the nitty-gritties of this process, and our vice principal and IQAC co coordinator, Srimadhi Chandran Chakraborty, who mooted this theme of uh, sustainable development and uh, multidisciplinary approach. And through the process, she played a pivotal role in motivating us to explore the various dynamics and the theme in its entirety. The entire journey of the preparation was truly enriching, wherein the focus was on various facets of charting sustainability. Uh, talking about the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 2030, agenda, which invites us to work hand in hand in view to find collaborative solutions to alleviate poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that people live in harmony and peace. Given the unprecedented challenges of our times, especially the COVID-19 pandemic and its aftermath, the onus is on the academy and industry to reinstate the purpose of education, which must be in sync with the sustainability goals. And that's how our uh, IQAC coordinator proposed that we take it forward. And we've got good human response also. 
in line with our traditional Indian wisdom, which is distinctively recognized for espousing holistic development and glorifying the symbiotic relationship among all the elements of nature, which will ultimately lead to self-preservation, accelerating growth and development. And this is where we talk about Gautam Buddha's uh, dictum of infinite co-relationship that he always professed. It also reminds me uh, Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore's clarion call to envision sustainability in each and every series of our life. When one of Tagore's poems, which is known as Disgraced, it exemplifies the need for harmony and interconnectedness. And Tagore puts it beautifully when he says, those whom you push down will chain you down. Those whom you leave behind will leave you behind. The more you envelop them under the darkness of ignorance, the more distant will your own welfare be. So this harping on this, this is an essential underpinnings of essential oneness manifesting in coexistence. Similarly, the dictum of uh, I am because we, we are, uh, which is the crux of Ubuntu philosophy, draws on this aspect of oneness. Uh, likewise, uh, the American transcendentalist, uh, Walt Whitman, Emerson and Thoreau, all of them exhibited a deep connection Nature. Deep connection to nature, this strong sense of social justice, uh, something which the contemporary thinkers realize is essential for sustainability to be achieved. Okay. Thus, the conference is organized with to bring together people from diverse fields, and that's what we attempted. Now, as we move ahead with the conference, I would like to welcome a beloved principal, a uh, great source of inspiration, an ace statistician who is a voracious reader, to deliver the welcome address and deliberate on the core of the conference. Yes, over to you, Doki, sir. Good morning, all. Somnath, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Is my video on? I can't see my video here. Yeah, no. yes. It is uh, visible also, audible also. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Somnath. Uh, due to some technical glitches, I could not join at 10 o'clock as decided. Good morning, all dignitaries. Uh, we have been organizing this type of sessions, conferences. One minute, I'll just switch on to another device. Sure, sir. Give me some time. And then main money on the other. Mills are Okay, good morning once again to all of you. I, Dr. Gnanisha Doke, principal of the college, welcome all of you on behalf of my management, Karnataka Vidyalaya Association and my college, Emil Dhanukar College of Commerce. Good morning, Dr. Peter, and welcome to this uh, one-day international conference on research methodology. So not the other speakers have not joined till the time. Yes, no. I can't see them. Yes, and not all have joined as yet. Okay, okay. I'll continue. Yeah, please. I'll continue. So this college is a more than 60-year-old college for information of my other participants and delegates. Uh, and of course, for the chief guest. This is basically a commerce college, started as a commerce college 62 years back. But right now we are delivering 
education in the field of mass media, communication, finance, accounts, banking, insurance, and so many other fields, information technology, right from higher secondary or plus two level till PhD in different disciplines. My management parallel with the association uh, is very keen in implementing national new education policy. Uh, national new education policy is likely to be implemented in the state of Maharashtra from 23-24. And there is more stress on inculcating research culture among the students in national new education policy. And therefore, uh, we, we have been trying to uh, call students also for this type of conferences. And fortunately, we have seen that we have 121 teacher participants and 100 plus student participants. So I congratulate all the organizations, organizers, Sachin Joshi, Somnath sir, Suresh Rao, and if, uh, Aniket Shuddhodhan, and of course, their guide, my vice principal, Dr. Chandana Chakravarti. We have been doing this type of programs. Last in this academic year, we had one 10 day faculty development program on research methodology. Then we had one short term course of six days called sponsored by UGC, HRDC, Human Resource Development Center of UGC. That was again in research methodology and specifically for using statistical tools, using different programming tools to uh, analyze the data. Basically, it was in data analysis. And we had a program on R. We have Power B. We had a advanced Excel and SPSS. So many other things we introduced to the researchers. There were also around 40 participants. And it was also a good success. So this conference is an international conference dealing with several topics. It is a multidisciplinary. Here also, I think we have received 83 papers. Correct, Somnath? Yes. 83 yes. research papers we have received. And some more we are expecting. Yes. Uh, this is going to be a one-day conference. Initially, we will have a few speakers till 1.30, I think, as per schedule. And then from 2 to 4, we will have paper presentation in different groups. We have made three groups. So there will be a paper presentation. Some people are going to present the papers and some may not present. We are trying to get it published through UGC journal, recognized journal or Scopus journals so that it will benefit to participants also for their career development in future. Uh, and their research will have a good tag that is it is UGC care journal or it is a, a scope of journal. So I don't have much thing to say on this conference because uh, all the participants are going to present the papers and our speakers are going to speak about our sustainable development program or our th themes. So I, I will not take much time and uh, I'll revert back to Somnath. Thank you, Somnath. Thank you so much, sir, for being a great source of inspiration all of you and guiding us through the process and bearing with all our questions that repeatedly that we have come and approach you for being available. Thank you so much, sir. It was possible because of your support and guidance. Thank you, sir. So I now take it over from sir and take the privilege of uh, introduce, introducing our uh, keynote speaker of the day. And I feel really feel privileged uh, to introduce him, uh, Dr. Peter Shulman. Now, Dr. Peter Shulman is professor of French and International Studies uh, at Old Dominion University, where he was recently designated as eminent scholar. He is the author of the Sunday of Fiction, the modern French eccentric, as well as La Dana Livre du Settler. If I have pronounced it correctly, so please correct me. So with Misha Zabutin, he has translated Jude Swern's last novel, The Secret of William Scotsit, and a collection of his plays, A Thousand and Second Night and Other Plays, George Siemens, 
the, uh, the 13 culprits, as well as a meditation on waves by Mari Garyask on waves. Now, so suburban beauty and from poet Shaks, rather Adama from poet Selin Zins and Ying Shen's collection of haiku impressions of Sama and Sylvia Barron's Supervene Spoons, Pages of Travel. He's currently the co-editor in chief of a journal of eco-criticism, Green Humanities, and has co-edited the following books, The Marketing of Eros, Performance, Sexuality, and Consumer Culture, Chasing Esther, Jewish Expression of Cultural Difference, and Rhine Crossings, France and German in Love and War. His translation of Marie Neumann's play, Another Year, Another Christmas, was performed by the Hebristic um, Publishers Theatre um, Company in Columbia, Ohio, and New York City in November 2017. He is currently the second vice president of the Pacific and Ancient Modern Language Association, titled and names, acronymed as PAMA. It is indeed a great honor and a privilege to have you as a resource person, a resource person of your stature, who, and I request you to give us your enlightening uh, keynote address. Over to you, Dr. Shulman. Thank you, thank you so much for that warm introduction. I'm, I'm most honored to be amongst you today as I have such fond memories of being in India several years ago. And um, my father was also very connected to, to India as well. Uh, and so it's a great honor to be with you. Um, and uh, of course, if anyone has um, an article to submit to Green Humanities, our next uh, issue is on environmental justice. So you're all welcome and invited to... Um, send an article or an abstract. Um, so I'm going to uh, be very informal to a certain extent. I'm going to guide you through a PowerPoint. I'm not the greatest wizard with PowerPoint, but um, but uh, I think it'll be fun to do that today. And so uh, I'm gonna share my screen and then uh, tell you what I have in mind. Um, have I shared it yet? Uh, what? Not yet. Of course, technology will fail. Yeah. Oh, see. do I have the power to share? Or am I co-host? Yeah. Yes, can I look into that? Yes, sir, you yes, have the... Yes. Ah, and yet something is amiss. A, a um, uh, let me yeah, see. Let me see. I got it. I got it. Yeah. How's that? Yeah. Now we can see it. Lovely, lovely. So the 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 when um, um, Professor Jamukia invited me to this conference, I was uh, very trepidatious, um, as uh, sustainable development is something that I'm very concerned about, but not necessarily an authority on. My authority is more in literature. And in fact, as um, you mentioned, I'm um, a Jules Verne expert. And um, I was thinking about it and I was realizing that the power of literature is very prescient and it can be. And even though the, the title of the conference is on contemporary trends, I'm going to begin with a non-contemporary trend, a 19th century trend, but the surprise when I was gestating this idea was that this 19th century trend really does project into our century now. Um, and many people have thought that Jules Verne has been very prescient. He's a father of science fiction. Um, and, and therefore he was endowed with all these predictions about space travel and submarine travel, exploration. But that's not the Jules Verne that inspires me or that I'd like to share with you today. Um, he was rather complex. Um, I, I start with this quote from Gaston Leroux, um, whom many of you may know from his, uh, his popular novels like The Phantom of the Opera. Um, 
And he uh, was startled when he was reading in the early 20th century uh, Jules Verne novels. And he was saying, we live in a time when all of Jules Verne's imaginings on earth and the air and beneath the seas are being realized so accurately and so completely that one can no longer be surprised if his novels enter the realm of reality as well. Um, it is not such a big surprise because uh, Jules Verne was someone who researched his works with incredible uh, scientific um, acumen. He would research and, and look at the state of the art science at the time and project them into colorful novels meant to inspire young people and older people also in the 19th century with, the, with endless possibilities. However, when I was thinking of his very first novel, um, Five Weeks in a Balloon, Cinq Semaines en Ballon, which was uh, a novel that is very, it's considered very cheery and very optimistic. In fact, many of his early, most of his early novels are considered uh, just very enthusiastic about life, very, very positivistic in a way. Uh, even though his very first novel wasn't published in <laughs> Paris in the 20th century because it's so grim in its predictions of capitalist society run amok in France. It was so negative that his editor, Hetzel, decided to put it away and instead encouraged him to write Five Weeks in a Balloon, which is essentially a colonialist fantasy of French explorers over flying over Africa and um, making comments and supporting French troops and, um, and, and looking at all the different wars that were going on. Um, and then tr ultimately uh, the French triumph in a colonialist victory at the end of this novel. But he does sprinkle um, ideas, uh, pessimistic ideas about the future of the world were humans and uh, to go amok and not take care of the planet. Um, and I quote this one right here. Uh, Kennedy is one of the explorers that joins the Frenchman in this ex in this overview of Africa, which already is very symbolic in its, its vision of Africa. The, the Europeans and the American are above Africa looking down on the savages, let's say. Um, so it's 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 very critiquable <laughs> novel. But he does sprinkle this comment and he says, um, the time when industry gets a grip of everything and uses it to its own advantage may not be particularly amusing. If men go on inventing machinery, they'll end up by being swallowed by their own machines. I've always thought that the last day will be brought about by some colossal boiler heated to 3,000 atmospheres, blowing up the world. And I bet, he adds, well, the Yankees will have a hand in it, said Joe. Um, and indeed, we see in a lot of earlier novels and especially later novels, uh, so almost a warning about climate change, about overproduction, pollution, the destruction of the planet, things that have echoes, alas, in today's world. So his predictions um, go beyond just the fantasy science fiction ones of space travel and other explorations, but with climate as well and sustainable development, as we shall see. So one of his least uh, studied novels is La Jaganda, which is um, uh, an adventure tale in the Amazon. And it's, it's sort of raft, as you see, but it's sort of a steam raft filled with um, with uh, engines and sort of a microcosm of a, of a town onto the raft. And they're escaping, I mean, it's an adventure novel, so they're escaping all sorts of bandits and um, political forces trying to capture the heroes. Um, but they do go down the Amazon, and, and Jules Verne worries about the natives in the Amazon. And again, he puts this prism of over-industrialization and cruelty in, in the European capitalist system and the American one as well, that is going to swallow up ruthlessly indigenous people. So one of the quotes from Jaganda, we must, we must look upon what it is to occur as having already occurred and see nothing but the present in the future, 
for the future is but the present a little further on. And that's sometimes how we feel today in the acceleration of very dangerous trends in um, uh, in unsustainable development, as we sh I shall go on in a minute. Right now, I'm going to present certain themes in Jules Verne's work that haven't really been uh, studied very carefully, and then see how they might project into certain situations today. Um, so in, in, in that very novel, he's going down the, the Amazon, he worries that the virgin forests, the, um, the tropical forests would be destroyed for logging, essentially, which, of course, if we now follow trends in Brazil, for example, under the former president, Bolsonaro, that's exactly one of the dangerous trends that he was doing, which was to cut down the Amazon forests um, uh, for logging. Uh, and in the process, uh, wipe out um, indigenous tribes near the logging that he wanted to enact. Um, so Van also projects that co that continent will turn grow old. Her virgin forest will fall under the acts of excessive demands made upon it. When that time comes, Africa will also offer the new races of the treasures accumulated in the breast for centuries. So that's a reference both to the Jaganta and in Five Weeks in a Balloon. It's the law of progress. The Indians will disappear the Indians in the Amazon, he says, faced with the Anglo-Saxon race, Australians and Tasmanians have vanished. Faced with the conquerors of the far west, the Indians of North America are being erased. And one day, perhaps, the Arabs will be annihilated in the face of French colonization. So, of course, today, that is not a very PC quote, but he is in the midst of French colonization at the time, which is actually being... Um, praised in the French newspapers uh, as very heroic, romantic adventures in Algeria, um, in Tunisia, um, in Guyana. Um, uh, and Verne, even though he promotes adventure stories, has a great suspicion of what is going on at that time. Um, and in fact, <laughs> this is the suspicion also comes to fruition in one of his later novels. Towards the end of uh, Vaughn's career, he he became excessively pessimistic. His editor, who had um, basically tamed his negativity and pessimism towards humanity, died, and his and uh, and therefore he had free reign to give him more a darker vision of humanity. Um, and he attempted in one of his last novels to create one last adventure tale um, in the Sahara off of, um, and he modeled his hero over François Le Seps, um, Francis Le Seps, who was an engineer, a failed engineer, who tried um, at first to, to um, dig the Suez Canal, but then had all sorts of failed projects, including this one, which was to flood the Sahara <laughs> and therefore create a little ocean in the Sahara to make more commerce easily um, transmittable. Um, and um, in this novel that is supposed to glorify Le Seps, the engineer, the failed engineer, um, uh, one of his characters comments um, about the world under these kind of um, crazy plans our planet has certainly met more extraordinary things than that. I don't mind telling you that the idea does occupy my attention at times. Although it's not an obsession with me, you've surely heard of the lost continent of Atlantis, which is covered today not by a Saharan Sea, but by the Atlantic Ocean itself. And at definitely established latitudes, there have been many chasms of that kind, although on a smaller scale, I grant you. What happened yesterday could happen tomorrow, couldn't it? The future is humanity's great surprise package, replied Lieutenant Viette with a laugh. Exactly, my dear lieutenant, declared the engineer, and when the package is empty, the world will come to an end. So a lot of theme, in a lot of novels by Vaughn, he talks about Atlantis as a sort of paradigm or um, an example of the ephemeral nature of humanity and their projects. They may have grandiose um, ideas about building cities, about um, empire building, but in the end, they wind up at the end of a sea. And the Saharan Sea is no exception because it's an impossible, idiotic project. Um, um, 
And at one point, uh, one of the characters also discusses the engineering follies at the time. And he says, present day engineers really have no respect for anything. If they had their way, they'd fill the oceans up with mountains and our globe would be nothing more than a smooth polished ball, like an ostrich egg with a convenient network of railways. So that's in from that novel, Invasion of the Sea. And it's also talking about a major uh, railway they want to do in addition to uh, flooding the Sahara uh, and all the, the the nefarious aspects of that, but uh, a major railway linking Egypt to almost to South Africa. And we know that there were many uh, ambitious railway plans at the time that failed. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to mirror all these these comments with um, with examples from today, uh, but a few more um, from his least studied novels. One is particularly pessimistic: the five million, um, the Begin's Millions, it's called, um, and um, it's about an American, no, a Frenchman and a German. They inherit all this money and they build. Um, basically dystopian cities on the west coast of America. Uh, one is dystopian because the German wants to create an industrial military complex city uh, and exploit the workers, but then the French one is also dystopian, even though it's supposed to be utopian, uh, but it's all about hygiene and the fear of germs and the fear of contamination. So it's not particularly utopian by today's standards. Um, but the des descriptions of the industrial complex, of course, could be written by Wordsworth in London or today in Pittsburgh or Cincinnati in America. And he writes, black macadized roads surfaced with cinders and coke wind along the mountain's flanks. The air is heavy with smoke. It hangs like a somber cloak upon the earth. Um, no birds fly through this area. Even the insects appear to avoid it. And within the memory of man, not a single butterfly has ever been seen. Thanks to the power of an enormous capital, this immense establishment, this veritable city, which at the same time a model factory has arisen from the earth as though from a stroke of a wand. Um, and um, and definitely we can, we can see this mirrored in um, disastrous uh, cities in America, uh, I'm thinking now of Jackson, Mississippi, for example, where um, the water, the, the 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 water was so polluted from neglected infrastructure that uh, funds were misdirected. Instead of helping the the citizens of Jackson, Mississippi, they were um, circumvented to help a football field in the north of Mississippi. Um, and meanwhile, the workers in, in Jackson, Mississippi, were living around contaminated water sources, um, had no recourse, and they were, had been forgotten. Um, and again, he, uh, Van, in these later 19th century novels, really focuses on a sort of a Thanatosian cityscape, cities built for war, built on capital, meant only to exploit, then to destroy enemies. And so one of the, one of the uh, quotes from this novel, death alone seemed to float over the city whose tall chimneys reared above the horizon like so many skeletons. So he, Valen was very much influenced by his visits to England um, and, um, and seeing the, the coal factory towns and the industrial pollution uh, affected him, but it also affected him in Alsace, uh, where the coal factories described by Emile Zola, for example, created horrible soot and pollution that disturbed the workers um, and, and caused them great illness. Um, and of course, we see this reflected in America again, <laughs> the American America that Varen was so suspicious of um, today in West Virginia, so many miners with the miners lungs um, are completely um, uh, at the mercy of their uh, very poor healthcare systems. And this leads me to a few more points on Van before I go on to more modern examples. Another unpopular Verne novel towards the end of his life is Sans Dessous Dessous, which means topsy-turvy. The, it's the purchase of the North Pole. 
And it's actually a sequel 20 years later from a more optimistic, cheery novel from the Earth to the Moon or around the, the Moon, um, where the proto astronauts are discovering uh, space orbits and is very cheerful. 20 years later, the same characters who had optimistically circled the moon um, now come up with a very grotesque plan to um, buy sections of the North Pole that have been auctioned. And then with the same technology or new improved soi-disant technology that they use to project themselves into space, they now want to project a big cannon um, uh, to the moon to de to change to move the axis of the world um, to destabilize it so that climates eventually disappear and it stays the same all year and by doing that they can they can melt the polar ice caps uh, under which they believe are great um, sources of coal uh, and they can get rich on this that's their plan. <laughs> um, and so they create an auction to auction off the North Pole, only they have all the money and the, the indigenous populations um, who live there um, can't afford it. Um, they can't afford to, to bid on the auction. And so the capitalists in the topsy-turvy will eventually buy the land which they win in an auction to then exploit it and destabilize the world, maybe destroying the world in the process. Um, and so this is uh, Verne's relatively feeble attempt at um, um, help defending the indigenous populations in the, in the northern regions um, because he, he really wasn't that um, you know charitable. But he says, oh, those people... The indigenous from the northern regions would have no voice in this chapter. And then how could these poor devils even place even a minimal deposit during the sale spurred on by the North Polar Practical Association? How could they even have pay in that? In shells and sea oils? Yet the land belonged to them. They were the first, yet no one consulted the Chukis, the Eskimos, the Samoyeds. And that is the way of the world. It's a topsy-turvy world. Um, and even in, in Verm's more popular novel, um, nature goes through extraordinary convulsions um, that humble the humans. Um, there are explosions of volcanoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, fires. And in that, hubris of men or, and women are, are, are suddenly melting. Um, um, and we see the mysterious island, for example, where the castaways become entirely dependent on nature and where they before were dependent on technology and war machines during the American Civil War. They learn to be humbled by nature and to understand that the cataclysms are nothing that they can control. And again, Mysterious Island is really quite a lovely book in terms of ecology. Um, Verne um, gives us many recipes of using nature to make clothes, to eat food from, from the plants, to heal, to, um, to clean the air, to clean the water. Um, they come up with many, many different recipes to do this when they're castaways on this strange island. Um, in fact, there's, there are great passages of botany in the book where Verne proposes certain healing characteristics of all the different exotic plants on this island. And lastly, in my Vern, my Vern panorama <laughs> um, is the very favorite 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which people remember as an adventure story, uh, where the Captain Nemo, meaning no one, um, in his submarine basically destroys war machines, uh, sinks them, uh, sinks the boats and lives in a sort of hermetic existence underwater. But what many people overlook are the immense passages of uh, examinations of fish and crustaceans. Um, at one point, uh, he he does a, an analysis of algae and he, he talks about this sort of self-sustaining world under the sea that's protected 
against the evils above the sea. Um, and Captain Nemo is incredibly ecological in the sense that he uses everything natural. He doesn't uh, kill anything. He 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 admires and observes the underwater existences. And he says in this quote. The sea is everything. It covers seven-tenths of the terrestrial globe. Its breath is pure and life-giving. It is an immense desert place where man is never lonely, for he senses the weaving of creation on every hand. It is the physical embodiment of a supernatural existence, for the sea is itself nothing but love and emotion. It's the living infinite. As one of your poets has said, nature manifests herself in it with her three kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, and animal. The ocean is the vast reservoir of nature. And he will go on to contrast that. The, the Nautilus, the submarine, goes through Atlantis as well. Um, and um, he, uh, he, again, laments the hubris of mankind, of humanity, that is too busy constructing false utopias or false dystopias um, maybe real dystopias, and ignoring the natural world. Um, and at last, this romantic Captain Nemo pointed to his prodigious heap of shellfish, and I saw that these minds were genuinely inexhaustible, since nature's creative powers are greater than man's destructive instincts. And again, there's the, this fantasy, if he could only see our century now, how, in fact, the, what is going on under the sea is very exhaustible, uh, overfishing and plastics, as I mentioned in a few minutes, um, and um, pollution and all sorts of horrible things are going on that Captain Nemo would have been appalled by and yet not surprised by. Which leads me to our contemporary times and um, what I what inspired me in Vern to look at contemporary issues through his eyes and what he would see, I think of the Congo right now, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, and the horrible things that have been going on there in the last uh, 20 years. Um, here are the coal deposits um, that are, are being uh, burned and, and creating all sorts of pollution, but in order to get to those coal deposits, have free reign to them, uh, militias uh, in 2001 and 2002 and 2003 committed all sorts of genocidal activities on the pygmy po population, which they had demonized uh, and, and killed uh, almost like 30,000 of them uh, in order to grab the deposits of coal that Jules Verne had mentioned was very interested, uh, very interesting to capitalist forces. Um, but what really also is concerning just today is this. This is the beautiful um, virgin forests uh, of uh, the Virunga. Um, and remember I mentioned the, the almost silly, laughable, topsy-turvy novel by Van where he, where the characters are auctioning off the North Pole in order to destabilize the Earth to get the coal, um, and much to my horror, <laughs> um, just a few months ago, I read that the president of Congo, Felix Tshisekedi, um, has decided to auction these precious virgin forests um, to oil companies around the world. And he, I'm quoting him, and his quote is, our priority is not to save the planet, uh, but to feed the poor in Congo. Um, he was extremely disillusioned um, by recent trends in um, Europe, Norway, for example, which was very known for sustainable forests, um, was suddenly digging for oil offshore. Um, and uh, the Ukraine war, the Russian war has, has increased uh, desires for oil um, and made him very depressed. <laughs> and um, and all uh, Techi Vidi just three months earlier from his proclamation was in Glasgow for the Conference of Global Leaders on Climate Change and was awarded $500 million to protect these very forests. Um, 
And then he realized that for the oil, he could get $32 billion and he uh, and it was totally worth it, even if it destroys the planet, which of course it very well might because we need these uh, forests for oxygen, but also um, it is in this incredibly beautiful park called Virunga. Maybe you've maybe you've seen the there's a film a documentary that was done maybe ten years ago, twelve years ago called Virunga, where it's one of the greatest gorilla sanctuaries, and the guards there, the 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 forest rangers, had been doing an incredibly heroic effort to protect the park from poachers and soldiers from invading militias who wanted to poach as well and maybe dig for things and they were endangering their lives to protect the forest and now the president of congo has basically sold or auctioning off the entire forest for oil production um and that has absolutely catastrophic visions uh for one the spill off of that would contaminate the congo basin and there's a lot, the, there are the peatlands here uh, and the rainforest in the Congo Basin store carbon. Um, and uh, we know that they're mining like crazy here for the cobalt from which we get our um, cell phones, for example. Um, and there's a lot of exploitation there. Most of the people uh, funding these mines are from uh, other, either other countries or invading armies like Rwanda and Uganda. Um, with their proxy militias trying to um, extract the minerals, but exploiting the workers terribly who are not getting anything. And the, uh, the president of Congo thinks that by selling the oil in the auction um, and the land, that it will trickle down to the people, but that has absolutely failed in two other countries nearby, Equatorial Guinea and Nigeria, uh, which had a similar plan, but they had horrible spills of oil that killed a lot of people and polluted a lot of land and also did not trickle down, unfortunately, financially to the poor. Um, so the peatlands are particularly scary too because the chain reaction would unleash the carbon. There are billions and billions of carbons being stored in the peatlands and that would be released into the air and pollute the world to a cataclysmic condition. Um, and if that weren't enough, charcoal and deforestation in Congo has also run amok in the Matameava forests, um, where um, whatever forests are not being auctioned off are being destroyed for charcoal. So if you find a model um, more comforting in South America, you would be hard pressed because to find another more scary novel um, example than in Ecuador, uh, which also is inspired by the auctioning off of land and forests desperately, we, which we need for air <laughs> to Chinese oil companies. And as we see here, um, a good chunk of Ecuador has been sold um, to these companies that are destroying the Amazon rainforests. So if we thought we dodged a bullet in Brazil uh, with a changing of a regime there, um, other countries are more than happy to take up the slack of deforestation and um, rainforest exploitation. However, I don't want to depress you too much. Um, Maybe I do, I don't know. <laughs> but um, there is a positive model. Um, remember I was telling you about uh, a mysterious island uh, by Van, where nature and ancient um, uh, forest management saves the castaways. Um, in Canada, actually, um, there's a lovely um, push um, to fight climate change by letting the indigenous people in the boreal forests up north repopulate the forests using their ancient techniques. So on the right, we see uh, logging companies had done a great job of deforestation. Um, but the Canadian Go government fortunately saw this trend and said, 
Okay, the uh, Indigenous First Nations in the Boreal Forest, you have the right idea. We will let you replant and recultivate these lands through um, nat the natural cultivations that they have been practicing for centuries that have actually been evaporating with uh, trends in contemporary life that are threatening the old culture, but they then return to their old practices and recultivated a lot of the destroyed forests. Um, and a similar trend is going on in Haiti. Um, we know that deforestation in Haiti, uh, which Valen talks about in one of his novels, The Lighthouse at the End of the World, um, he talks about deforestation already in the 19th century. Why? Because in the 18th century, the French were already hard at work deforestating it in order to um, get the agricultural products that were enriching France, uh, like sugar and rum and all sorts of things like that, and coffee. Um, and Voltaire famously said, do you know where the sugar that you use for your coffee is coming from? It's on the backs of slaves in Haiti. Uh, and this trend would continue continue dangerously up until the 1990s, but only now is there, um, so this is like a vision, for example, of two trees where there once was a forest. Um, and if you look at radar um, satellite pictures of, um, of Haiti, maybe just going back 20 years, uh, we see a shrinking, 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 almost non-existence forest, but now community groups are investing or reinvesting and replanting forests thanks to uh, aid organizations abroad who are helping to fund reforestation uh, through community villages uh, who are doing it. Uh, they've already increased by 300,000 um, a new forestation. Um, so again, I don't know how much, I've lost track of time. I'm so apologetic. Um, uh, I thought I had an ocean of time, but I may be running out of it. Um, so you have, you have to. Oh, in that case, <laughs> never give a professor too much time. <laughs> um, but um, when, when, um, when I talked about Nemo and this sort of retreat under the sea and this embracing of all the riches of the sea, it's hard not to think of Today's sea, uh, we know the coral reefs being uh, uh, evaporated near Australia, but the, the major invasion is in microplastics and plastics. Um, you know, the sort of illusion of recycling in America where everyone recycles their plastic only to go to China and going back into the sea. Um, and then the microplastics that are ingested by fish, which we are ingested by people, which are recreating sort of a cycle of plastic. Clearly, Jules Verne wouldn't have imagined that, but he would have been appalled by the mistreating of the ocean that was so filled with wonder and richness um, in, in Nemo's world, which was a counter world above the sea, and now is just a replication of the disasters above the oceans. I'm just giving this example just because it fascinates me. It's nothing that we should really be alarmed about, apparently. Um, but the, in 2010, there was much alarm about China's Three Gorges Dam, which um, which is a feat of technology, but but also that they had to flood the entire banks of uh, the Yangtze, um, moving populations just as Vaughn has predicted in other countries, like the invasion of the sea, literally invading the river was invading uh, the banks of the Yangtze, making ghost towns of all the, the towns along the, the, um, along the banks. Um, but in 2010, there was most notion about the dam actually slowing the earth's rotation. Um, and I can only think of our uh, mischievous astronauts in topsy-turvy who are trying to destabilize the Earth's rotation for profit. And the Three George Dam actually did slow down the Earth's rotation by um, maybe a few seconds. So it didn't really change our world, but it's still an, an alarming trend. Uh, and going back to the counter Nemo narrative, um, where he romantically talks about the inexhaustible sea and writes literally like 20 pages 
per chapter describing the beauty of all the different species of the ocean that um, that are allied with humans um, and that can do all sorts of things, including creating energy under the water for the for, to to motor the the submarine, um, and of course the same very fish that. Nemo found inexhaustible are now being exhausted. <laughs> it is no surprise, and you are all familiar with the overfishing of the blue fin tuna, for example, but other overfishings then and and the great danger of running out of fish. <laughs> so reading 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea today, um, where children or young adolescents in the in the 19th century marveled at what was underneath the sea. Um, reading it today is almost a very nostalgic vision of that time that doesn't exist today when the sea is being exhausted. And I end now <laughs> you, with um, a vision of, an, uh, of a French theorist that fascinates me. Um, he's Alain Badiou. Alain Badiou and um, Bruno Latour are two very dynamic French philosophers who talk a lot about ethics and um, how to conduct one's life as a species. Um, but Badiou is very concerned about the exhaustion and basically the collapse of what was called the Anthropocene. Uh, obviously, a the, the idea that humans control the planet now is in question. Um, and Badiou writes a lot about this in his ethical treaties, um, for example, Ecology and Metapolitics, where he worries about this Anthropocene vanishing uh, and with just cause for all the things that I mentioned above that perplex me today, perplex me in today's newspapers. And he gives a very step-by-step -step ethical treaties that could really emerge from either 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or Mysterious Island, um, which were um, framed as adventure novels, but really are ecological tales of how to respect nature, how to use it to one's advantage without destroying it, of the healing properties of nature, um, the self-preservation of humanity through nature. Um, but you constructs very similar narratives in his philosophical treaties, um, encouraging us and warning us about the two trajectories. The one trajectory is the Vernian approach that we see in Mysterious Island and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the respect for nature, the construction of nature as an ally, the growth of nature, and of course, the respect of nature as a destructive force that not respecting it will do, as we see with climate change today. Um, and the increase of hurricanes and floods and fires. Um, and then. Oh, I'm about to finish. So. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. That was uh, some background uh, noise. Excuse us. Oh, no, 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 not at all. No, not at all. No, no, no. I, I just wanted to end on, on that note, the two trajectories that Badiou uh, enunciates um, and the political questions that the the Anthropocene can vanish or it can uh, be preserved. And we know the dangers are right there in front of us, uh, especially these alarming catastrophic uh, conditions in Congo right now or Ecuador um, that will literally cause um, the end of the planet not nuclear war or things like that. So these are just my musings. I, I, I would have loved to have constructed a paper um, maybe with uh, uh, all sorts of theses and antitheses, but I'm, I'm confronted with these issues and I'm, I'm really grappling with them. And sometimes when I grapple with issues, I return to Vern, who's not the greatest philosopher. He's very much a, a emblem of his time and he's for sure not a projector into the future, but there are nuggets in him that I find um, interesting today to grapple with modern uh, conflicts. So that, that's basically my, my tale uh, from Los Angeles, California right now. Um, and I know it's a bit of an eccentric one, uh, but um, that has come out of my readings of late, whether it's the New York Times, whether it's Badiou, whether it's Jules Verne, or all sorts of um, Canadian authors, which I can tell you about as well, 
that I didn't have time to talk about today. So thank you so much for um, listening to me. Uh, I feel that sometimes I'm like Captain Nemo myself underwater, and it's good to resurface sometimes with such good company. It was lovely listening to you all through. Yeah. So we are just uh, starting for some questions that comes to us. Just give us a, a, a we are, as you're talking about uh, the whole element of Anthropocene, so that's aspect of Anthropocene that it's, would you elaborate on this a little further? Because Anthropocene now, as we understand it, has its uh, whole relationship with time as well. How uh, since time and memorial, the ecology has been affected by the uh, activities of humans. So all those elements, like how do you see that we've responded in the sense we have responses from Eastern coast as well as the Western, uh, East and West both. So how do you see that you know, authors are taking this? As just it calls to my mind, you know, the writers like Amitabh Ghosh and yes. others, Yes, we've explored that a little bit. I love Amitav Ghosh, and I would have yes. talked about him, but I'm hardly an expert. I read him for pleasure. Yeah, so if you talk about how, you know, how Jules Verne maybe, uh, or in, in relationship to this, because uh, the, I guess the theorist, if I'm not missing out, missing out on the theorist, the Pesh Chakravarti also has... Uh, yes, absolutely. There are yeah. many people who talk about the Anthropocene. Yeah, it's very yeah, yeah. contemporary trends in yeah, all yeah. sorts of uh, different um, uh, literatures and articles and essays. It's something that worries us with reason. Uh, yes. And of course, Baron didn't have that term, but he does talk about it very closely in the um, Journey to the Center of the Earth, which sure. again is read, can be read in comic book versions, or it's the actual version, which is filled with this this sort of like time travel almost. He goes, they go down, they go down, and they they follow these codes, and um, they see um, the pre Anthropocene. <laughs> they see dinosaurs, they see mammals, they see cavemen, they see all sorts of other worlds down there, and basically they're descending into time. Um, this is a vision of the past that that frightens them and inspires them at the same time because they see that humanity could revert to that um, or do something more in, uh, enlightened and make the world better. Um, uh, or on the third solution is to destroy everything. And in fact, when they come to that idea, um, the voyagers down there are expulsed from a volcano in the middle of Iceland and in many, many of, Ver, of, of, of Vernon's novels end in explosions, cataclysms, destruction of things. Um, and unfortunately, the, the voyagers are expulsed and they come out of the volcano alive and, and chastened by the experience. Um, but other times, like there's a novel called The Golden Volcano, where greedy developers are trying to get gold in a volcano and they make a mistake and they over they try to blow it up and they get blown up and it blows up everything around them uh very very often in Verne, either nature takes the place of humans and punishes them uh for their follies or the humans do something stupid and they themselves get blown up and so Val very much talks about anthropocene kind of themes without actually using that word but, he's, but definitely mm -hmm. which the center of the earth is definitely like a reflection of, wow, this is where we were, where are we going now? And we could easily not be on the top of the chain anymore. Um, sure, sure. That's what I guess you've talked about the convulsions of nature. Right? So All the time. Uh, Stor sure. And most every single novel has storms, fires, earthquakes, explosions of, of, of ships, explosions of volcanoes, explosions of coal mines, uh, Thanatosian experiments with weapons. There's definitely this theme of complete nuclear, not proto-nuclear destruction. Um, it doesn't have to be a nuclear bomb, but there are other things that can destroy the world. And he's very, very susceptible to that. Somehow, that, Again, yes, yeah. please. Yeah, please, please, yes, please. I mean, again, most of his tales are cloaked in an appeal to adolescents to make them feel good and cheery, uh, but there are always this underlying 
image of destruction, pessimism towards humanity, the, the absolute conviction that humanity will destroy itself because they can't contain their thanatos, thanatos basically, and greed. It's pretty, he had to curb his negativity, his pessimism to sell books, but it was constantly there. His first novel, Paris in the 20th Century, as I mentioned, is a dystopian vision of Paris crushing individuals with this need for productivity. Yeah, uh, the, and consumerist, the consumerist yeah. approach. Absolutely. Because 19th century France was the rise of French banks and capitalism. Yeah. And it went completely amok towards the end of the century, leading to lots of uh, bankruptcies. Um, Oh, under Napoleon III. But again, there these his minor novels are the ones that are most wacky, like The Invasion of the Sea, The Flooding of the Sahara, which actually came from a project by Le Seps, the engineer who helped the Suez Canal, uh, wanted to do that, wanted to flood the Sahara <laughs> and put boats on it um, with disregard for the people there. And this we see constantly in Vern. Um, he was not, uh, he, he wasn't uh, evolved in, this, in, in, in terms of PC natures in the 19th century. He was very much tried to promote a colonial sedenda, but he does talk about that a lot. Okay. Protecting the indigenous. Oh. So this is what, and then as we see that there's a lot of research happening in this regard of uh, dystopian elements, and especially if we talk about uh, extending it to digital dystopia, uh, there are digital dystopic novels and writings, and th there, are, there are possibilities of getting into research in those areas. So how do you look at that uh, area to be explored? Now, now there's a question here uh, that from the viewer that we are receiving, uh, that you know, current trend, how do you see that digital, human, digital dystopic novels uh, or digitally, ah. yeah. So how do you how do we respond to that? What are the possibilities of research in those areas? Oh, they're very fascinating ones um, in Canada and Quebec. Um, Catherine George, for example, writes a lot of these novels so that are these dystopian visions of digital digital situations and uh, replicants and and um, people living underground and never seeing the the sun. Um, and, and in Canada, it's very, very cold a lot of the times. And, and so there's this idea of retreating, but then, uh, but then there's also like this uh, proliferation of technology that alienates most yes, people. And yes. that's why a, a lot of Quebecois write nature novels and novels in the forest. But Catherine George is a fascinating writer. She does have capture this out of control technology that alienates more than it helps that uh, and this we see, we don't have to be dystopian or digital to know that this is going on today, that has been going on for the last 10, 15 years. The sure. famous book, um, Alone Together, about that was just about social media 20 years ago, alienating more than it was bringing together, um, is something that's multiplied uh, millions of folds by, by the, the digitalization of just novels and things like that. Um, so... That, that is not new. I mean, Blade Runner even talks about, it's like always, the, you know, Philip Dick talks about constantly this feeling of robots replace, not just replacing humans, but we can't tell the difference anymore um, between them. Um, I don't want to keep on going about Bound, but Bound also talks about this in one of his most gothic novels called The Carpathian Castle, where a mad count who's in love with his opera singer who died creates a hologram of her uh, and becomes obsessed and scares all the people in the village. Um, but then he has all these diabolical experiments to, dig to digitalize basically Transylvania. <laughs> and that also ends in this major explosion of his, his diabolical castle. Uh, but, the, but the hologram survives. <laughs> oh, so most of it uh, ending in a sort of explosion, volcanic eruption that we see, right? Or, or many of his writings isn't it? so that you're saying there's uh, these kind of eruptions and uh, somewhere it just calls to me uh, calls to my mind those kind of uh, you know, 
Eastern philosophy, no, I don't know, Western uh, mode of uh, uh, standpoints have always been a linear process, probably. Uh, but in Eastern line, we see that as a circular mode, that, uh, how we have this idea and theory of trinity as uh, uh, Lord, as creator, sustainer, and destroyer. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So, so you know, the, the part of destruction is not um, minus the process of creation. So probably we are, as you are seeing, as you are charting the whole uh, process, and uh, most of us are in a state of deep anxiety, with various things happening. Probably we are just uh, getting into a process of renewal that you are, that even uh, probably Jules Verne tried to uh, highlight implicitly highlight. That's not just an observation that I have to make. Yes. Yeah, the, it's definitely there. The two poles, the destruction and the creation, um, constantly fighting it out. Um, it's beautiful, actually, uh, when you see that dialectic in fiction. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a spiritual component to these works. Yes, I've, yes, I've been finding them a lot in the Quebecois fiction, actually. Uh, I find it fascinating now, the, these trends of uh, both Anthropocene and um, revival or recreation. Um, and in poetry, too, in Quebecois poetry, it's, uh, it's very rich and very enriching with these themes. We take note of that. I guess uh, <laughs> our, our American transcendentalists also explored it. Definitely. So that's it. I'll just uh, look into a few more if we have a couple of more questions. Otherwise, then. Uh, uh, so, Nat, sir, yeah. we have yes. one more question. Yes, please. Yes, yeah. Please. Uh, yeah, Peter, sir, there's a question that's come up from Shuddhodan, sir, who is my colleague. Comment upon the ecological concerns and need to have a realistic approach of the governments of the developed and developing nations. So how do you address this issue? I'm sorry, I missed the very first part yeah, of that so, question. Uh, we would like uh, you to comment upon the ecological concerns and how can we have a realistic approach of the governments of the developed and the developing nations? Yeah. Uh, oh, developing uh, nations? Yeah. The point ah, is yes, okay, good. Um, well, uh, I mean, I'm a literature professor mostly, but I also teach international studies. And um, I was just discussing it earlier this morning with a friend and we were talking about Congo and we were talking about these very much needs and we can understand the cynicism that the government would have. It's like everyone else is exploiting them why, and we have poor people and we need to feed them. Um, so why should we, why shouldn't we do what we need to do to do that, uh, and and that's that can be mirrored in many many countries, um, but and and Congo has a sustainable development target from the United Nations and other sustainable development organizations, but they're not respecting them. It's unwieldy, um, so. Ah, there has to be a happy mix. I mean, that's a, I, utopia. I'm not, I'm not a politician. I can't tell. It. But but um, their state. The statement was correct. Was understandable. Um, they need funds and they have the resources. But also from a world point of view, the statement, "Why should we care about the planet?" is also equally disturbing. So there has to be incentives to marry the both. That's what we thought was going on in Glasgow was the incentive to protect the forest with a $500 million. But billions of dollars seems much more beguiling than the 500 millions. So there's, as back to Jules Verne, he would totally understand that, that the greed is, is far stronger. And unfortunately, if, if we thought that could be the solution, yes, absolutely drill away, and then that'll be the end of your problems. We know that this is not gonna be the end of the problems. On the contrary, um, we see every instance where that is going on, that it actually causes war problems and, all, and no sharing of profits. Uh, the two examples I gave you are just two of many examples, Equatorial Guinea and Nigeria, but it's replicated so many other times. Um, 
uh, no matter where, even the pipeline in America where they said, no, don't worry, there's never going to be any leak. Of course it leaks. Of course it destroys. Um, so, um, so I think there has to be a balance in the sense that you need to understand the developing countries, um, but also give more of an incentive not to have the destruction of things. We all live on this planet. Uh, and yes, there's huge amounts of hypocrisy and brutality. And um, but that doesn't mean it's a license to give up. Um, so a happy medium has to be in order. Um, and I'm not understanding. I mean, I need to speak to more Congolese. I know the situation there is dire. There are wars in the Eastern Front. Um, the exploitation is is catastrophic. But this particular project is beyond the catastrophes that are already going on because that is the destruction of the planet. And if the destruction of the planet ha happens, you can have all the billions you want. And not only are you not gonna feed your poor, but there won't be any poor to feed because there won't be a planet to feed. So that's of the crucial nature. I don't know if that answer is a very simplistic answer. I don't know, I'm, I'm not uh, a savant of, uh, of, the, of uh, the UN or anything like that, or a politician. I'm just giving you a very informal point of view, but it is something to be, con we are concerned and we have to show concern too for those countries. Thank and you, the, de and the, developing, the developing countries are out of control also. Um, we see this in America, but also China. Um, there's no control, uh, no incentive. Uh, there's too much corruption. The Yangtze is one of many, uh, but there's, there's so many other instances of pollution and, and ravaging and hypocrisy. Yeah, Exactly. That's what you initially highlighted about the ravages of capitalism that, uh, that has been. And the impact of it, it's somewhere, somewhere or the other, the impact is on. So that's what, you know, another question that comes interestingly is the role of cinema and literature probably can play a definite role in, in this, towards the sustainability. More oh, generally. yes, if I, if my, if I hadn't been fixated on Verne and all that, that was my fixation. I would have talked about cinema, which is really my, yes, my passion. Um, and, and of course, that's the tool that we can use to enlighten. Um, there's so many, even in, there's so many African films about ecology, um, Virunga being one of them, uh, but that was 10 years ago, but there are other ones like Limie about the waters being polluted and the, and the ways we can, we can, um, stop that, um, for example, but there are tons of examples of documentaries or fiction that talk about um, the destruction of the planet and ways that we yes. can revert that. Um, there, there in and of itself is a wonderful project for a book, I would say, and uh, perhaps you've inspired me to work on that. But, uh, sure. but cinema, I mean, I mentioned Blade Runner for a one, but there are millions of them, um, millions of examples of both dystopia and healing powers uh, and, and, and efforts of normal people to thwart um, this massive destruction. Sure. Of course, yes. the accordion of examples <laughs> is not at my fingertips right now. However, <laughs> they're there. <laughs> yes. that is what, so I, but yeah, I cinema, think... cinema, if you, if I were to talk to you again, yeah. now, would be have my plan would be to write give you cinematic examples of sustainable okay. development ideas. We look forward to that. <laughs> oh, good. Me too. That would be a great idea. Yeah, have a workshop kind of thing with cinema, Hollywood, Hollywood put together. Government That's true. Is. I'm here now. Hollywood is a paradigm for excess and destruction and uh, fantasy and illusion as well. So true, true. So it's uh, and we have our Bollywood, Hollywood, Indian cinemas. As you know, going oh yes, Indian cinema is uh, completely enlightening. Mm. Um, of course, my favorite is uh, Satyajit Ray, but there are so many yeah. others. Oh, yes. We talk, Ray we talk is about forerunner. Yes, exactly. Good. So that's what well. I guess there is endless conversation. There's a lot to learn and hear from you. It's very difficult to you know, just wind up such an intellectually stimulating session. But as we're nearing uh, the time, I think we have uh, come down to this. I, Nancy, ma'am, if I can 
hand it over to you. Yes, so thank yeah. you. So I, I just sent over to Mansi ma'am for a, uh, a proposing a formal vote of thanks to you, uh, Peter, and look forward to uh, meeting you in person soon. Thank you so much. I'm deeply honored and, and thanks for indulging me in, in oh, my yes. syncretic uh, visions. <laughs> Goodbye. Where from the creation happens. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Matsya. Yeah. Uh, so, Peter, sir, thank you so much for sensitizing us on the topic of sustainable development. It was really a privilege to hear your views on Jules Verne's concern, large Uganda, the invasion of the sea, dystopian novels, talks of convulsions of nature, around 20,000 leagues under the sea, and the futuristic work. Your sensitive portrayal connecting to contemporary times through the events of Congo was really great. You were very well highlighted of how environmental destruction is happening across Congo under capitalistic forces. Uh, also the attempts of community groups of Canada, Haiti, and attempt of reforestation. I'm sure it was a great value addition for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I look forward to meeting you in person soon. <laughs> yes, yes. And yes. I, I request you to Wait back if you can, because we have our next person who is uh, added to the Department of English at Central University. Can I can't wait to come back to India. Yeah, she be, yeah, yeah she'll be highlighting on critical elements. And she has done her PhD from Germany, Heidelberg University also. So she has this uh, East-West connection, deeply embedded in her. Yeah, so I would request you to can wait back through, through that. Yeah, so you just, I am to over to. Thank yeah. you again. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm incredibly honored and delighted. Thank you. Sir. Good night and good, good conference. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. As we move on to our next session, it is a great honor for me to welcome our guest speaker and next resource person, Dr. Drupati Chattopadhyaya who is heading the Department of English, SNDT Women's University, Mumbai. She has been trained in literary studies at Lady Sriram College, Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU, New Delhi, followed by her PhD program from Edinburgh University, Germany. Her areas of interest are post-colonial studies, culture studies, digital humanities, and emerging literatures. Today, she would be reflecting on eco-criticism and Indian graphic novels. I request uh, Dr. Drupati Chattopadhyaya, ma'am, to take over. Uh, thank you, Mansi. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, can you just make me the co-host so that I can share my PPT? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, you can share the PPT. Everyone can share. Everyone can share? Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, can you hear me? Hear me, see me? Yes. 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 Everything. Right. Yes. Great. Um, uh, thank you, um, Shomnath, for inviting me um, to this conference. And the first talk was um, excellent. And I think it, it was a, a great beginning uh, to a series of conversations that will happen today. Um, in particular, um, I was uh, very happy that uh, uh, Shomnath was organizing, uh, part of this organizing committee was organizing this conference because uh, rarely do we have uh, conferences um, on ecology, and I'm using a broad umbrella term because now ecology has um, come to contain uh, so many uh, things, eco-seeing, climate anxiety, eco-composition, I mean, so many uh, various facets of, of um, ecological consciousness that have come into being. Um, that I, I thought it was an excellent opportunity uh, to talk across disciplines because, um, and, and therefore I think uh, Dr. Schulman's talk was excellent because um, he sort of brought various uh, disciplines uh, together in his talk. Um, and and uh, with uh, talking about ecology, I think that is, is some, somewhere we should uh, sort of begin. 
Um, and, uh, and that is uh, uh, also going to be my starting point when I talk about graphic fictions in India um, and uh, talking about ecological concerns in graphic fictions in India. Because I think for a very, very long time, and I'm, I'm sure you must have had the same uh, sort of experience, uh, that climate change was something that we always saw um, as, as, as something which is external to us, uh, some greater forces, some evil forces around us um, are apparently uh, doing great damage uh, to the environment. And it is essentially a scientific discourse, the way that we were taught in schools, the way that we're still taught in schools or environmental studies classes, that it is something which is external to us. It is something that uh, belongs uh, to the domain of, of scientific rationality and scientific knowledge systems. And it uh, really uh, sort of talks about, at least in popular discourse, uh, really talks about the human in, in this ecology and humans as actors. Um, and I think I will uh, sort of uh, start from there and, uh, and try to look at uh, contemporary graphic uh, fiction or narratives from India um, and try to see where these uh, links sort of form consolidate um, and offer new ways of seeing uh, us as actors uh, rather than um, uh, you know distant observers uh, in, in questions around ecology. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a brief uh, outline uh, of my presentation and I was as I was just uh, telling Shomnath I'm uh, really um, <laughs> really, uh, in, in a sense, um, uh, a little ashamed of, of my presentation skills because they're very, very basic, but I hope you will get the point. So this is how my uh, how I've structured my presentation, um, understanding that this is a, a more, um, uh, you know, a mixed sort of audience. I will begin with why, what, and how, why am I talking about graphic novels? What are they? And how do they concern us when we talk about uh, ecology? Um, uh, the second uh, section of the presentation uh, will look at two critical concepts uh, that I feel uh, uh, sort of come together when we talk about graphic fiction uh, um, and climate fiction, uh, which, which is in the form of graphic fiction in India. And I'm going to be talking about eco-criticism. Uh, eco-criticism is a very, very general uh, sort of idea, but eco-criticism and the post-human term. And uh, in the third section, I will try to use these uh, sort of frameworks to read uh, certain contemporary graphic fictions uh, from India. There are many, uh, you know, they're sort of, uh, the market is sort of now exploding in terms of the number of graphic fictions uh, that are coming out of India and that concern uh, the environment. So I've picked up a certain, uh, uh, again, you know, very canonical ones, but um, nevertheless, uh, this is more like an exploratory uh, sort of lecture. So I, I hope uh, you will bear with me. Um, so uh, the the very common uh, sort of question uh, that we ask are used to cartoons, comic strips. Uh, so what are graphic fictions? Are they uh, are they comic strips? Um, uh, and, and should we read them like comic strips, the way that we are familiar with when we open a newspaper every day? So are we going to read them as cartoons? And therefore, the, the major question, the major genre question, as it were, is what is a graphic narrative or a novel? Therefore, novels uh, or fake Times, words and images. And sometimes in certain graphic fictions that you find, there are no words at all. For example, uh, uh, um, if you look at a very, very uh, called Apu Pen, um, a number of his novels actually are only about images, right? So there are images after images after images forming a narrative, right? So sometimes it is not even um, a combination of words and images, but it is a continuous narrative. 
uh, there is no specific length to do graphic fiction. Again, they are of varied lengths. Some are very short, um, only a few pages. Uh, they are um, uh, they they are uh, uh, self-contained units, which are very small uh, uh, pieces. And there are ones which which have a full length, uh, you know, uh, sort of like um, I don't know whether you can see this on my screen, uh, or rigid sense. Uh, River of Stories, which is a novel yeah. in India, um, and you can see that it is a, a, a novel-length work. Uh, so some some of it is a book-length work, some of it is um, uh, short fiction. So you have a number of anthologies, uh, for for instance, in graphic fiction um, in India in particular. The Oxford Dictionary describes it as a full-length, especially actually science fiction or fantasy story published as a book in a comic strip format. So I think the comic strip format um, is, is quite interesting in terms of how it is, um, uh, uh, how we can understand it, that it's not necessarily a comic strip, but in a comic strip format and this is a distinction i think that we have to make um, as as readers as discerning readers of graphic fiction that they are not supposed to be consumed as comic strips but they are in the format of the comic strip which makes and and i will talk about it which makes uh, uh, the readers a sort of participation or entry into the format um, uh, 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 a very interesting uh, sort of mix of participatory as, as well as sort of a distant uh, uh, reader. And we, we'll talk about that, right? And, and something that we need to uh, remember in this regard, uh, which is very, very interesting and very different uh, from the other uh, kind of literature that we are very used to reading, that it is a very, very recent uh, sort of uh, genre that has come into being as late as, as the 1970s. Uh, so the first uh, uh, graphic fiction, uh, as it were, is Will Esner's A Contract with God and Other Tenement Stories, a graphic novel, uh, which was published in 1978. So it, it is a very, very recent uh, sort of uh, uh, format, right? And um, I think that uh, sort of allows a lot of contemporary issues uh, to, to be foregrounded uh, in novel ways because it is a format that is developing as it were. It has not completely taken shape. It is not necessarily the dominant form quite the other way around. And it has immense possibility to therefore incorporate everything that is ha happening, all the conversations um, around uh, us as it were. Um, I, um, I'm taking this uh, particular understanding of the graphic uh, uh, fiction. Um, and I think it, it is very, very useful where um, uh, Stephen Weiner uh, talks about how graphic fiction is a book length comic uh, books that are meant to be read as one story, including collection of stories and genres such as mystery, superhero, or supernatural that are meant to be read apart from their corresponding ongoing comic book storyline. Um, and why are we talking about, now that we have more or less figured out how do we sort of understand graphic novel, what is a graphic novel, what do we mean by a graphic fiction, the next question uh, that I, I promised that I would be talking about is, why talk about graphic novels in India in, in connection uh, with um, ecological narratives? Uh, so one is that in particular in graphic novels uh, in India, um, uh, we, we see that the graphic novel form in India has, um, has responded to issues um, which, are, uh, which have been considered uh, too politically uh, conscious uh, for Indian writing in English. And here, when I talk about the graphic novel, uh, although it uses a number of languages, as you will see, uh, um, it is actually multilingual, uses a lot of hint. Uh, it, the, 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 uh, the predominant language of articulation has remained English, right? 
Um, but what it has initially um, essentially done is responded to particular socio-political, very topical issues with which a lot of uh, dominant literary practices have evaded right, uh, which includes talking about partition, which includes talking about the emergency, um, biographies, uh, very innovative biographies, lived biographies, if you can uh, term it that way, of Ambedkar and Fule, for instance, and a host of other uh, uh, questions like um, alternative sexualities, uh, child sexual abuse, um, and definitely ecological concerns, something that uh, for uh, a large number of, uh, you know, um, uh, a host of Indian literary practices have ignored over a period of time. So it has, as a new genre, it has incorporated a lot of topical issues which are of our concern. And one of the prominent areas that they have um, uh, they have sort of um, uh, invested in is ecological concerns and and another part of what uh, the, the conference is about sustainable development this is something that is of prime concern in a number of graphic fictions that have come out of India starting from the 1990s. And it employs very, very interestingly, something that uh, uh, Professor Schulman was hinting at um, is, is it employs, um, uh, although it, it seems uh, like a form um, that, that, is, um, uh, that, that is very elitist in its concern um, uh, or, or in its presentation, um, it is very, very concerned about the aesthetic practices um, that, that come uh, from India. So we understand, therefore, in that context, going back to why, we understand concerns, uh, ecological concerns that have come out of India within the framework within the aesthetic concerns that have emerged, aesthetic practices that have emerged from India. For instance, um, a lot of uh, graphic fiction uh, in India, um, which is, uh, again, uh, that concerns, uh, uh, that, that, has, uh, that highlights the concerns of uh, climate change, uh, for instance, will employ uh, traditional uh, aesthetic practices of um, of Adivasi populations uh, who have been, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, who have been affected the most in terms of climate migrations, um, and uh, their aesthetic practices have been obliterated. They do not feature in the popular medium. And I, as I will try to show you, that these are the uh, sort of aesthetic practices that make way into the graphic fiction that you will read uh, about climate change in India, which makes it sort of doubly productive in the sense that um, not only are they talking about concerns, climate concerns from the perspective of India, but they're also employing strategies, aesthetic strategies that have come out of India. Um, now, in connection to this, it's very important uh, to understand the concept of post-humanism, because I think post-humanism has made the most impact um, in, in terms of how we understand uh, ecologies around us. Because um, as, as um, you know, students of social sciences or humanities, we are very, very familiar uh, with a very Eurocentric, um, uh, you know, version of, of events, of historical, political, geographical events, cartographies around us um, that we have, uh, you know, we are very comfortable, stable sort of cartographies that uh, we are familiar with. They all come from this understanding of, um, of human beings at the center of the world. And that is something that we, we study as the anthropocentric sort of turn, right, where the human being becomes the most important um, actor uh, in, in the way that we understand the environment around us. And that is a turn that comes with the Renaissance. Now, with post-humanism, which is again a very recent uh, development uh, in in, um, in in philosophy um, um, or Western philosophy across the world, uh, the the idea of the human as the center of the universe is somehow is is somewhere uh, being questioned. 
being shifted. And that makes a major uh, sort of impact in terms of how we understand ecology or the environment, right? So if human beings are at the center of the, uh, uh, of, of the world, of everything that concerns them, then they have, then, then they have the sort of uh, philosophical might, uh, as it were, or legitimacy then to plunder, to pillage uh, for their gain, because they are the most important actors in the in this world, as it were. But if we were to shift to post-humanism, where other concerns, non-human actors, become equally important as human beings, then there is a shift in terms of how we can think about ecology, the possibilities of uh, forging relationships with other actors in, in this environment as it were. So I'm just going to quickly run you uh, through um, uh, through what we uh, we mean by posthumanism and how important is the human in posthumanism as it were. So um, uh, Keeling and um, uh, Lehman in Oxford Research Encyclopedia talks about posthumanism as a philosophical perspective of how change is enacted in the world as a conceptualization and historicization of both agency and the human. It is different from those conceived through humanism, whereas a humanist perspective frequently assumes the human is, and, and uh, please note these ideas that they're talking about, which becomes very, very important, autonomous, conscious, intentional, and exceptional in acts of change, a post-humanist perspective assumes agency is distributed through dynamic forces of which the human participates, but does not completely intend or control. And you can see the immediate shift that I was trying to talk about. So post-humanist philosophy constitutes the human as a physically, chemically, and biologically enmeshed and dependent on the environment, B, moved to action through interactions that generate affects, habits, and reason, and C, possessing no attribute that is uniquely human, but is instead made up of a larger evolving ecosystem, right? So if you look at the three points, I think they're crucial to the way uh, uh, that we need to look at ecology, ecology in relation uh, to post-humanism. We have to move away from a humanistic uh, sort of perspective. So there is little consensus in post-humanist scholarship about the degree to which a conscious human subject can actively create change, but the human does participate in that change. And the last sentence is very important. That is where human beings as actors in ecological um, uh, you know, concerns become important. Um, and as uh, Stable uh, says in 2020, in uh, uh, very, very recently on post-humanism, which I think is of immediate concern to us as we talk about ecology, about how humanity technology and non-human nature are increasingly interdependent and not integrated. So human beings are not necessarily at the top of the change chain, but they are interdependent and integrated in other systems which are not necessarily only living beings, but also technology and non-human nature. Um, now we move to graphic fiction and post-humanism. And this is very interesting because as I was talking to you at, uh, at the onset, that why should we use uh, post-humanism as an operative term when we talk about ecology and graphic fiction? And um, Edward King and Joanna, uh, and, and that, that is very, very interesting in terms of how, um, uh, how, for instance, the global south or our geographical location uh, becomes very important when we talk about, uh, you know, ecological concerns, something that Dr. Schulman was talking about. So ecology is not necessarily um, uh, a politically neutral 
uh, sort of humanist, larger liberal humanist perspective, right? We do not respond to ecology or ecological concerns in the same way because we do not have similar political concerns, right? The West, for instance, um, this is something that uh, that all of us are aware of, that the West or the developed nations, uh, something that I, I think came up in one of the questions uh, to Dr. Schumann's yeah. session, uh, that the West responds to um, climate concerns in a very liberal humanistic sort of perspective and says, you know, all of us should contribute um, and sign this treaty and all of us should respect the um, environment when they consume uh, much more uh, than the rest of the world, uh, multiple times of, of in terms of consumption. Right, uh, their carbon footprint is much more uh, than that of developing nations. Per capita carbon print is much more. Right, so ecology uh, or ecological concerns, therefore, cannot be. I mean, this is one of the ways of looking at it from the global south. But you understand the concerns multiple concerns. I mean, this is a discipline uh, in itself, and one can go on talking about it. But you understand that our geographical location sort of dead the ways in which we participate. Um, uh, uh, and graphic fiction, uh, very, very interestingly, has responded to um, uh, to this, this specificity of location also in terms of how we, we, we talk about non-human uh, actors uh, in, in ecological, uh, uh, you know, frameworks, which is, which is very, very interesting. And therefore, a very uh, interesting book um, that has uh, uh, come out from Latin America by Edward King and Joanna Page in 2017 called The Post-Humanism and the Graphic Novel in, um, in, uh, in Latin America. Um, uh, they say that the the, because of the, the novelty of the form, the form itself, as we were discussing graphic fiction, the form itself, the kind of possibilities that it offers, it allows for non-European actors to be talking about things, to be talking about issues uh, that, that, um, in, uh, that, that are not necessarily permissible or allowed in other standardized forms. Right. So he says particular emphasis on the ways in, in which humans are bound to their non-human environment. And these ideas are productively drawn out in relation to post-human thought and experience, many of which experiment with questions of transmediality. And this is uh, something that I will discuss with one of the texts that I have that they use multiple media. Um, the representation of urban space, how we, we conceive of urban spaces, um, how we see ecological concerns in these urban spaces, and modes of perception and cognition. And something uh, the, the last uh, bit is very interesting and very important for us, a new form of ethics for a post-human world. Uh, Lisa Dietrich in 2018 uh, sort of responds uh, to a lot of these uh, questions and says something which is very interesting in terms of the form. As a form, co comics and graphic narratives are particularly well suited for enacting post-humanism. They often employ radical juxtaposition and assemblage as method and the way that the images and the uh, the sort of sort of the texts are superimposed on one another the way that the images are construed as ways of understanding um, is it, as uh, what what uh, what she calls assemblage as method and delineate subjectivity as a process of becoming in relation to animate and inanimate objects, as well as human and non-human others. Very, very interesting. And this is what we shall sort of focus on, to look at what kind of subjectivities, right, um, uh, come through uh, in, in the graphic fiction as we talk about animate, the relationship between animate and inanimate objects, as well as human and non-human others. So this leads us to a, a, a very important uh, sort of question that between the popular and the esoteric, how does the graphic fiction therefore 
find a niche audience which sort of responds to a lot of these concerns that we have just spoken about. And there arises the question of what is called eco-composition, right? So how do you compose a narrative which is environmentally sensitive? This brings us to a very, very important question that I think uh, the, the opening remarks uh, have, have outlined, then what happens to critical geographies, critical ecologies, which are outside of the developing world, right? And um, uh, in that context, post-humanism or concerns about post-humanism in India are very, very useful, right? So Mignolo, uh, somebody that all of us are sort of familiar with, um, he he talks about an epistemological disobedience, right? That, that you do not uh, sort of um, adhere to uh, questions of, uh, in, in this case, uh, for instance, uh, ecological concerns that are coming from the West. And can you develop uh, uh, instances of epistemological disobedience? Can you, can you do that? And uh, as I will try to show you uh, through some examples that we probably uh, very, very uh, successfully do that with graphic fictions in India. So Monerul Islam, for instance, talks about, as it happens to be the case with many other postmodern discourses, the discourse of posthumanism seems to be a corollary of neocolonialism. Once colonized, now third world subaltern subject becomes the strategic object of the discourse. Since the posthumanism man will require its other and the otherness will be realized in the posthuman subaltern agency. And this is very, very interesting because this is something that plays out, for instance, it's a very, very self-reflexive uh, sort of uh, medium uh, graphic fiction and that sort of attends to these questions, do larger questions once we dissolve these boundaries, these hierarchies, do we then fall into another uh, sort of um, ellipsis, uh, as, as it were, uh, where the Western European developed, uh, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily European, but uh, Western man uh, becomes the center, uh, alienating others, putting us as ecological others, right? Uh, something that is very easy to do. Right. Uh, in this sense, the post-colonial and subaltern condition becomes assimilated into a post-humanism with or without consent, just as postmodern needs to contend with the ethics of a radical anthropological alterity surpassing historical difference. And this is it is this is very, very critical in terms of how we understand these overlaps. Um, and um, I will quickly, uh, this is something that I will not talk about in detail. I'll just uh, quickly run you through. So recent, uh, uh, you know, developments uh, in, in reading graphic fiction in India um, have um, uh, spoken um, about um, how uh, graphic fiction uh, should be uh, read as part of the larger Indian writing in English discourse because it follows um, uh, uh, the, the, the general narrative uh, techniques, um, uh, and but offers a new interpretive uh, frame. I just uh, skip this, and now we go to posthumanism and the ecological turn. That uh, that is something that is uh, crucial to our discussions today. Um, so the planetary as the ultimate spatio-temporal stage of posthuman condition respect for forms which are essentially non-human in nature. So if you if you look at the overlap of post-humanism and the ecological concerns, you see that they are very closely tied, right? Because the planetary becomes the ultimate spatio-temporal stage of the post-human condition, right? So once you dissolve these hierarchies, the planetary becomes the ultimate spatio-temporal stage, right? Um, and there evolves a respect of forms which are essentially non-human in nature. It re-evaluates the positions of humans vis-a-vis -vis the environment and other living creatures. And as uh, Nick Fox and Pam Aldred have very recently commented, that despite the current environmental crisis of anthropogenic climate change and environmental degradation afflicting the world, dualisms of culture, nature, 
human, non-human, animate, inanimate, something that we are very, very familiar with. These are our lived experiences. Sustain a perspective on the environment in which the human and the cultural are privileged over natural world and other species. And this is something that can be dismantled with, with these overlaps between uh, post-humanism and um, the ecological concerns. Um, now I come to somebody that we uh, spoke about and uh, Shomnath uh, sort of uh, um, uh, spoke about him. Um, uh, somebody that we cannot uh, sort of um, avoid when we talk about uh, uh, climate change, climate fiction, um, and ecological concerns in India is Amitav Ghosh, because he, um, in the great derangement um, uh, um, uh, climate change and the unthinkable uh, sort of uh, introduces uh, very, very critical concerns uh, about uh, Indian literature and uh, climate change that was, um, uh, that, that, that there was uh, 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 a huge sort of gnawing gap in terms of uh, how everybody else or other disciplines were talking about climate change and literature apparently was was very very silent about it right so he announces the silence he critiques the silence that concerns indian literature um in in terms of climate change right so he says that there is or there uh, there um, until the time that he was writing uh, the great derangement that, that there is or there was no real climate fiction that came out of India, and the book, in some sense, is a uh, is a sort of lament that that uh, that we have not been able to develop a critical response uh, to concerns of the climate in general, where it affects all of us, and that, in part, as I was uh, trying to tell you, has to do with the way that climate change was conceived as a discipline, as very alien uh, to humanities, as 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 it work, which is something that uh, Amitabh Ghosh changes completely. He says that there is an imaginative failure in the face of climate change. Derangement, therefore, is both imaginative as well as an epistemological crisis. Right. And he divides the book into three parts, which are very interesting. And um, uh, I think uh, 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 some of the questions in the in the last uh, session was actually also alluding to this. Right. Um, part one is stories, right, which he, he terms stories where he talks about literary narratives and the failure of literary narratives or literary establishments in India in addressing concerns of climate change. So he's, he sees uh, an abject silence, uh, absence, uh, silence in, uh, in, 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 in uh, literary uh, uh, genres. Um, in, in India on climate change. And, and he sort of gives a number of examples um, and outlines and also gives reasons for why there is uh, this silence. Um, I think part uh, two and part three are very interesting because part two, he, he talks about, and, and one of the reasons he gives is very interesting. He talks about how the way that we conceive of history in India, the way that we have conceived of our past uh, dictates the way or ways uh, in which we talk about our present. And therefore, uh, he says, um, uh, ways of historicizations that are prevalent, right? Um, uh, they, they do not allow for climate change to be one of the operative factors in terms of how we talk about our past. So the climate, the environment, uh, really figures in, in historical concerns, in, in the ways that historical narratives about India have been framed, right? And he says, um, uh, this is a term that we had just discussed. He says that Anthropocene should become a very, very important concern, um, a, a very important actor in terms of how we conceive of our history or histories. A uh, part three is again a question uh, that was that was asked, and that is something that he um, alludes to uh, uh, and, and discusses actually uh, to some degree, not to a very very great uh, length, where he talks about governments and structures and political establishments which have also failed us. Right. So the failure of political establishments to take into account the concerns of the environment. Right. So. This, this, the grid 
that uh, that he sort of establishes of looking at narratives, looking at history, looking at politics, sort of concretizes um, uh, ways of, of, of looking at or, or uh, theorizes why there has been uh, a sort of silence around issues uh, uh, concerning the environment in India, which is a very, very important document um, uh, or a critical response, uh, which, uh, which we will use them uh, to look at, uh, at, the, at, at, at graphic fiction. Um, I just, um, uh, uh, before uh, we, we enter uh, into the text, I'll just elaborate a little bit uh, on this concept of the Anthropocene uh, with, um, uh, with you. Uh, with Anthropocene, uh, um, uh, this is a term uh, which is very recent. It is a term that has been in use since the 1980s, and Kurtzen and Stomer uh, introduced this term. And the Anthropocene is a term that is increasingly used to define a new planetary epoch, one in which humans have become the dominant force shaping Earth's bio geophysical composition and processes. So human beings have been in charge of uh, changing uh, the ecological processes around them and therefore uh, causing uh, the, the sort of disruptions that we, uh, we've been discussing. So Anthropocene's origin, the working group's members now largely favor what is called the great acceleration. Right. So they see the period after 1945, and this is very important because it ties to our concerns of the graphic fiction. As I told you, graphic fiction um, comes into being in India only in the 1990s, starts off or kicks off in the West in the 1970s. And this sort of goes in, in, in terms of temporal sort of overlap, as you can see, that it goes hand in hand with what is called uh, in, uh, in, in um, uh, uh, concerns of the Anthropocene is called uh, the great acceleration, right? Um, so before that, uh, it was not that human beings were not changing the environment. Human beings have been changing the environment since they became settlers, for instance, right? They have been grazing cattle. Uh, uh, they have been uh, domesticating animals. They have been changing uh, uh, nature around them, taming nature around them. Various uh, scientific developments um, over the years uh, uh, have changed the environment. It's not that we have not changed the environment, but what has changed uh, in the last, uh, um, you know, 70, 80 odd years as, as, um, uh, as the working uh, group, uh, Kurtzen and uh, Stomer and Zalis Weitz uh, would talk about it, is the great acceleration. And this is something, this time frame is something that we need to therefore keep in mind. The period of extensive technological, demographic, economic, and resource use expansion from 1945 onwards as the original point, right? So if you see that these, this acceleration is the beginning of the answer to scene, as it were, it becomes very interesting to see whether graphic fiction then becomes the sort of, um, you know, uh, the, the dominant mode of articulation of climate concerns because of its temporal overlap and it sort of, uh, you know, announces itself, launches itself, right? So writers here are attuned, um, and, and in this context, uh, Dimmick has uh, recently uh, done some very interesting work where she talks about how um, in India, uh, Indian literature in particular, uh, has been more sensitive, according to her, about climate uh, fiction because they're attuned, as she says, or she reads, attuned to monsoons and their patterns, right? A real awareness of climate comes to in Indian literature, and I guess other regions in the world can learn a lot from Indian climate writing, right? So Indian climate writing, which, which uh, takes off uh, in the recent past, and here she's talking about Amitav portion and a couple of others says that it is attuned it, it develops its own what she is essentially saying that Indian climate fiction in the way that it has shaped up has has created its own language of articulation own language own dynamics of critical discourse which can then uh, you, be used as models for the rest of the world so I uh, begin uh, with um, uh, uh, can can you tell me how much time do I have left? 
हेलो 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 हाउ मच टाइम डू आई डू आई हैव लेफ्ट सम इज इट ओके इफ आई टेक 10 मिनट्स यस मैम यस यस मैम इट्स गुड सो एज आई वाज जस्ट yeah as i was just telling you that the first very interesting the first graphic fiction that comes out of india is actually about ecology right so this is the river of stories right and the river of stories is about the narmada dam and as you can see if you look at this picture um uh, and and i can show you the book also generally like to give you a sense or feel of the um narrative you see that they are filled uh with um uh drawings of the landscape they also incorporate a lot of as i was telling you um adivasi paintings right and uh even as it employs a certain very um very familiar comic strip format right it also employs a number of strategies of um here you can see it here as well i don't know whether um this is visible i have given you one yes. example right but visible. you can you can see these yes, patterns yes. uh that uh, that come up very very often um as 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 almost as counter to a, uh to the kind of comic strip very very uh, stable elitist sort of comic strip format that you see on the left is counters immediately with uh narratives or ways of representation of aesthetics that you find um in in these adivasi narratives their ways of articulations which have been silenced which have not found their ways um into uh, uh you know uh, stable uh, uh academic discourses as it were finds its place in the river of stories by origin sen um and you can see something that i was uh, talking about that it is intensely topical intensely local um it it uh, it uses uh, the example that i've given you you see that it uses a lot of devnagari uh, script uh, it and, and look at the composition uh, of the picture it uses uh, it actually shows how these landscapes that we, you know this uh, very the very very telling very moving uh, picture that dr shulman showed us about the congo right in a similar way when you see this picture without these uh, sort of um, images uh, and uh, these uh, uh, conversations uh, th that are uh, located that are uh, recorded over this picture you can see that this is a map it is uh, uh if you if you see the roll on the right hand side corner of the picture that you see this is a map right so a map is something that that desensitizes us um about uh, the people living there about their human concerns ecological concerns right they only appear um as as uh, physical demonstrations of uh, or physical elements that uh, compose uh, our our planetary uh, existence as it were right they are not people uh, they they do not have any living creatures as it were so you can um, and, and these are the kind of maps that we have all drawn right we have been asked to draw four mountains or whatever rivers right that they are not people uh, they they do not have human actors non human actors animate actors as it were right and it's very interesting that origin sen first uses a map and then uses these elements therefore you know superimposes them something that i talked about right in the beginning of assemblage of one on top of the other on top of the other and this see how beautifully uh, sen uh, sort of de de uh, delineates these individual concerns the concerns of the people various actors that make up this cartography as it were right and uh, adivasi narratives which have been completely uh uh sort of obliterated from the discourse of of uh, you know of, of construction of dams which which um which displaced with a lot of people right um the second image is a very disturbing uh image right and i was talking uh, in the beginning also about 
um, how the, uh, the, uh, the graphic fiction in India um, uh, has also attended to very uh, immediate political discourses, and one of them being partition. And here, uh, they also talk about the relationship. Um, this is taken uh, from uh, this side and that side. That is an anthology of uh, partition uh, graphic narratives, which has been curated by Vishwa Jyoti Ghosh. Um, it, it is a delightful uh, sort of read, and uh, you should uh, definitely uh, sort of uh, highly recommend it uh, that you read it. And this particular one is very, very interesting because it combines ecological concerns with concerns um, uh, uh, about geographies, cartographies, right? So partition is, um, and, and we've, we've talked about partition, about how it has affected, uh, it has displaced a lot of people uh, and then human concerns. But this also looks at what happened to these displaced people people as they occupied new geographies right so partition as we know that partition literatures are also concerned with only certain geographies right um and and most of it attend to urban landscapes right uh, for instance a very very you know, powerful image of the partition is the is is the railways right you would remember uh, you know uh, what is that uh, film gadare prem katha where uh, the train becomes a very important actor uh, you see that in kushman uh, sings uh, train to pakistan etc there are a number of uh, you also see it in uh, komol gandhar um, you know a lot of cinematic uh, representations of the partition look at the train a very technological uh, sort of um, uh, colonial intervention as a major actor in these displacements. But it's very, very interesting how Vishwa Jyoti Ghosh sort of turns it around, right? And takes you inside a forest in Madhya Pradesh where a lot of refugees uh, from uh, what was then East Pakistan and is now Bangladesh were relocated. And how did they tame their geographies without any technological support as it were? And here you can see aid, here you can see, uh, you know, broken houses, here you can see this um, jungle and you can see a refugee uh, uh, forest. You can, uh, you can uh, also uh, the narrative uh, uh, and, and suddenly the forest is peopled, right? It is hardly a forest uh, in, in terms of how it is represented. It's full of hungry uh, you know, people waiting for aid. Um, and, and almost a lot of them are faceless, as you can see, right? Uh, so faceless, nameless human actors displaced uh, by by partition, occupying a forest um, and and uh, beginning a new sort of relationship with a, a new found political uh, identity, which is India, and and situating it in a, a, a new found environmental context, right? And they talk about how this is is not suitable for human habitation, how they have come from um, uh, from places. Um, with a lot of uh, access to a lot of water, which they don't have here, et cetera. Um, and you, we have also very interesting post-human, um, uh, you know, uh, dystopic uh, fiction uh, that attends to environmental concerns, right? And uh, one of them uh, is actually hilarious and uh, very, very, it, it, it results in a lot of nervous laughter uh, once you read it, which is from this anthology called, um, I don't know whether you can see it, it's called First Hand Graphic uh, Fiction from India. And um, this is the book, right? And um, uh, this particular one is called KOF, Kingdom of Fish presents strawberry fish right so this is uh, this is like uh, um, uh, almost like a tv show that plays out in these narratives where um, uh, in a dystopic uh, future right people have taken to eating uh, fish a kind of strawberry fish that is the only food that is left and people as you can see in this picture that they generate their own biofuel Right, so they're sitting on a, a potty. They generate their own biofuel, which is then circulated back to them, right? So they have these bells, right? And it is an absolute sort of dystopic imagination of, uh, of the world where people have, um, you know, overutilized the resources. So there is nothing left 
and all that is left is a strange kind of uh, fish that is the only source of nutrition and the state you will see that the state tries to advertise it in various forms. It's very good for your health. And the same fish is uh, sort of uh, presented as a burger, presented as a juice. Everything, everything around them is called strawberry fish. Uh, the other dystopic uh, fiction, which again employs uh, a method uh, that we, we have talked about, of transmediality, of using various media uh, to, to articulate um, their, their concern, um, where uh, this is called Waste Sutra, right? And um, uh, this particular fiction looks at what happens to the worldwide waste. And, uh, and this is something that we just talked about, how Global South, uh, you know, the concerns of ecology that emerge from the Global South cannot be the same uh, uh, in, in, uh, as it comes uh, from developed nations. And this sort of, uh, this particular nonfiction uh, hits very, very hard there because it is talking about what happens to the world wide waste. And it all, it all ends up um, as, as they show in the Global uh, south right it talks about how in india imports um uh, uh you know tons and tons of waste very hazardous waste which is coming from mobile phones which is coming from electronic goods that the west does not need and here you see that it uses various kinds it uses photographs it uses illustrations uh, sometimes it also uses um uh, uh, uh you know uh, uh it, it fuses uh, various kinds of i'll show you in the next uh, slide and it is multilingual multimedia illustrations that you find here images are imposed over other images and there is an interconnectedness of Anthropocene geographies, right? So from the West, from, from developed countries to underdeveloped countries, we all consume, we're all part of this digital world as it were, but the digital waste ends up with, with us, right? And this is an image which is very telling. One very, very interesting uh, feature about this fiction uh, is that the, the faces of, of these characters can never be seen. They are faceless. They, they can be you, they can be me, anybody living in the global south, right? And, and this, our, our obsession with uh, technology that, that we have no idea about how the waste of this technology ends up and how uh, only a certain part of the population uh, th then suffers uh, because of it, right? And they're very disturbing images. The narrative is a documentary style and there are muddled figures as you can see it's sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish one figure from the other um, the psychedelic uh, sort of images and locates and here it locates you uh, as a reader firmly in the ongoing crisis and I will um, end up uh, with Amita Ghosh, because it, it gives a circularity to the kind of questions uh, that we have been uh, talking about. And I spoke about how uh, Amita Ghosh sort of begins this conversation uh, in India or, or in the South Asian context. So it's very interesting that after having written uh, a lot of climate fiction, as it were, his latest publication called The Jungle Nama, um, uh, it is located in a space that he has been uh, um, uh, he, he's been very, very familiar with, he, um, uh, he's been working on, he has written a number of things on, which is the Sundarbans, right? And uh, he has shifted finally to graphic fiction. So you can see, you know, I've brought you full circle and I'm telling you why graphic fiction and ecology is very important because uh, the, the father of climate fiction or whatever, the, 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 uh, the main person of graphic fiction, uh, climate fiction in India has finally come to uh, write, uh, uh, sorry, uh, climate fiction is, uh, in India has finally come to write a graphic fiction, which is his latest publication called The Jungle Nama. So The Jungle Nama is very very interesting in two, uh, two um, uh, contexts, multiple contexts maybe. It's a very, very interesting text uh, you should read. Uh, it's based on um, the, the narrative of or um, uh, myth of Bone Bibi. Um, so she is a goddess who is worshipped in the Sundarbans. And um, 
uh, uh, somebody who protects you from the tigers um, and other sort of uh, uh, you know natural disasters but it also sort of she also uh, uh, keeps a balance uh, between various elements various ecological um, ecology like the Sundarbans, like the deltas, right? So she's very, very important in maintaining this balance. And this uh, narrative is the first one that Ghosh writes in verse in English, right? Have we lost the connection? So I guess. Did yes. I did I lose? Yeah, just, did you lose me? For a minute. Okay, sorry. For half a minute, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'm just can, concluding, so it's okay. No, if you can share the screen again. Okay. Yeah, please. Can you see? Not yet. Good. Is co host, right? Hansi? It is showing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It is showing. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so, this uh, particular narrative is written in uh, verse. Um, very, very interesting. The first uh, one that Amita Ghosh attempts in verse, right? And um, I'll just. Uh, one minute. Suddenly disappear from my screen. Yeah. So I'll just uh, read um, a little bit from the Jungle Nama for you to get an idea of what kind of counter narratives um, is he offering. So it begins uh, like this This realm was once under the sway of Dokkini Rai. A mighty spirit feared by all under the sky. He preyed on humans in a tiger avatar. Whomever he wanted, he'd take for his shikar. Under his rule, uh, the kings shivered. Uh, uh, all beings shivered in terror. Day after day, they looked heavenwards in prayer. At length, their entreaties crossed the empty quarter. From Aravi, there came two beings of great power. One was the mistress of the forest, Bon Bibi. The other was her brother, Shah Jongoli. Bon Bibi was strong but full of compassion. Her brother was a warrior. His powers were legion. The stranger's arrival didn't elude the king right. Nothing in his realm escaped his unblinking eye. Who are these two? He thought, why are they in my forest? Just look at them, ever so calm and self-possessed. Do they think they can enter without permission? It seems that this pair is asking for a lesson, right? So it sets up this you know, sort of encounter between Dokkin Rai and Bone Bibi, and this Bone, how Bone Bibi sort of establishes a more compassionate, um, uh, a, a more, uh, it, you know, again going back, eco composition as it were, establishes a more uh, composite uh, sort of order in, in 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 the forest right and it's very interesting how he uses myth and images uh, to be talking about a very precarious uh, geography uh, that is often ignored uh, in um, uh, in in um, established literary practices uh, in india so i conclude with that thank you so much for being so patient and listening to me Yes, ma'am, that was really, really nice to hear you. Uh, ma'am, I have some questions here. So, yeah. uh, firstly, uh, Amar Chitra, Amar Chitra Kata and various comic strips are also graphical. So, in terms of graphic novels, is the difference due to the contents? Yeah, this is a very good question. This is something that uh, thankfully E. Dawson Burgess has already answered for me. <laughs> so I'll just quote her. Um, and she says that, yes, you can uh, draw a lineage, right? But there is a very distinct change uh, in terms of the language of the discourse, right? So Amit Chitrakatha was attending to a very, um, uh, uh, was, was, uh, uh, a lot about mythological uh, narratives, right? But uh, the graphic fiction that has emerged uh, from 1990s onwards, right, has a very different uh, language and a very 
different kind of aesthetics, right? One, as I talked uh, about, and I showed you also in the presentation, is of assemblage, how it uses various uh, images, one on top of the others. It talks about very topical issues um, uh, and uh, even uh, it, uh, mythological rewritings uh, in the graphic uh, fiction uh, genre after uh, 1990, something that Amruta Patil has done um, uh, with her Ramayana and Mahabharata uh, retellings. Also, you will see that there is a very contemporaneous topical references uh, that the graphic novels uh, have and the language, um, uh, the aesthetics language, I don't mean in the literal sense of the term, but in terms of aesthetics, the way that they use assemblage, uh, they use transmediality um, and, uh, and, and the concerns have changed completely. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, this is specifically, uh, I'm being selfish here and I'm asking it for our BMM students. Uh, can you tell what are the upcoming areas of research for English literature? I mean, um, yeah, this is one of them, right? Graphic fiction is one of them because this is, a, as I told you, that is very, very recent. Uh, it's just last 20 years, so there is very little... Uh, uh, research that has uh, really happened um, in this uh, area. Uh, another uh, idea that I talked about in terms of theoretical concerns, post-humanism is something which is again very recent, which has just come in in the last 20 odd years and has become very important in terms of how we look at the world uh, in a very, very renewed uh, sort of perspective. Um, uh, other than that, um, no, um, other than that, concerns uh, that that are again, world literature is making a comeback because again, you are uh, now um, uh, you know, world literature was dismissed say thirty or forty years back, and again, uh, that sort of uh, is coming into our conversations, into our classrooms. We are reconceptualizing it, not seeing it necessarily um, in the light that we were uh, seeing it earlier. Uh, then uh, caste as an important category uh, is becoming important in diaspora studies, which was not there before, right? Diaspora studies were seen as something, uh, and, and again, uh, diaspora studies have become very interesting now with trans-oceanic uh, sort of uh, uh, understandings of the diaspora, not just the privileged diaspora that we were reading in the 1990s, 2000s, your Jhumpalahiri and company, right? We are reading a lot more uh, from disprivileged diasporas um, that are coming from locations which were not, uh, again, because of colonization, parts of Africa, um, Suriname, um, uh, Trinidad, uh, Mauritius, uh, Seychelles, um, Malaysia, something that we haven't uh, uh, studied for a very long time. So transoceanic linkages uh, are very, becoming uh, very, very interesting. Translation uh, studies also is taking a different turn now. We are not necessarily looking at only language hierarchies. Uh, yes. We are looking at uh, various contexts within translation. So these are something that comes to my mind immediately. <laughs> yeah, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, ma'am, where can we explore more about literature and sustainable development? Um, you have now one great advantage is that there are lots of repositories like Wiley Online, um, like uh, JSTOR, like Project Views, which hosts a number of journals. Um, and uh, Professor Schulman uh, heads one of those journals. So um, a lot of journals which attend to these specific concerns. So a good way of beginning is to pr probably follow a couple of journals which are uh, talking about this from, from your disciplinary perspective, because ecology can have a very anthropological uh, sort of uh, turn, something that uh, he was uh, also alluding to when he was talking about Badiou, right? So it can be very anthropological, it can be literary, it can be uh, economic, um, uh, it can have various locations as it were, and depending on your disciplinary location, you should look at specific journals that attend to your concerns. Right. And that would then open up ways of uh, entering the field. Yeah, ma'am, thank you. Isn't graphic fiction through forms become a mode of writing back, as you mentioned about novelty of form? 
I, I didn't get your uh, question. Sorry. Can you come again? So, uh, Ma'am, you spoke about graphic fiction, right? So it's become yeah. a mode of writing back, as you mentioned. So can you comment on it a bit more? Writing back as in uh, empire writes yes, back sort yes. of thing. Yes, definitely. Because see, the aesthetics are very, very interesting. They don't care. They're writing in, um, look at the sort of illustrations. Right. right. They're not necessarily derivative in any any form, right? They're disrupting ways of how uh, images can be construed, images can be read, right? Look at the distribution of images, right? They're not uh, neat. They do not follow any specific ordered way of looking at, um, at, at aesthetics. And aesthetics is definitely very Indian, even when they're talking about global concerns, as we just saw with ecological concerns that they are, they are very fixated, they're, they're, they're grounded in, in South Asia. They're grounded in India. The concerns emerge from that. And they're obviously contending larger, very, um, they're very sort of ephemeral uh, concerns about the climate. Uh, that are very distant comes from a very only scientific rational discourse that can uh, very liberal humanist rational discourse all human beings should uh, you know act in a certain way to save the climate for instance i mean um, uh, not to take anything away from greta thunberg but, right but you need a lot of money and resources um, to travel from sweden in a small boat to the us how many people from South Asia, even when they want, can afford it? How can you afford a boat ride for two months? Who is going to fund that? There are people who do not have anything to eat tomorrow. Right? So right. it is, uh, again, to, to assume that all of us can become Greta Thunbergs is, is again, a very um, difficult <laughs> sort of position to take. And, and you cannot take that position coming from the context that we are in. And I, I think graphic fiction in that sense is doing the right thing. Because as I said, if you look at River of Stories, for instance, it is talking about Adivasi narratives. Um, uh, I mean, it's peopling uh, the Narmada Dam uh, project literally with people that we have never heard, we have never talked about and their concerns. So yes, I think it, 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 in, a, uh, in, a, in a number of ways, it's also puncturing a very... Um, uh, uh, very, very umbrella-like uh, humanist ideology of the of climate and ecology. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Uh, one of the participants has asked a question. Usha Nayar, what is the readership for graphic fiction? Is there a different reader or are the textual fiction readers now reading graphic fiction? This is very difficult to estimate, uh, but um, it is it is definitely looking at a very niche audience because uh, you need to, although, uh, you know, we commonsensically think that images are uh, something that uh, sort of speaks to a number of people, but the kind of intertextual connections uh, that these uh, texts make require for, uh, uh, for the readers to be aware of a number of things to be able to understand those images. For instance, the map that I showed, right? If you're not uh, aware of, of the sort of colonial connections of cartographies, right? They were the ones who started making the maps the way that we see our geographies around us, right? So you have to read into them. So it is definitely looking for a very niche audience. And um, yeah, I think it is becoming more and more and more popular. So um, uh, it's a very recent uh, phenomenon. So it, it is becoming more and more popular and, 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 and a large number of people are actually reading it. Thank you, ma'am. So Nath, sir, over to you. Yes, yes. So thank you. Thank you so much Rupini, for being there and being a resource. You are a resource yourself and also have always been with us uh, whenever we have come forward with any such uh, plans and programs related to research and development. So the talk that you have delivered today was uh, both an intellectual and a visual treat, obviously, so to say. And you've taken us through this you know, exploratory aspects of graphic novels, its uh, inception and the way it's taking shape 
So that was indeed very, very delightful a lecture. And how, what are the possibilities that we have seen through? And though you have focused on Indian writers, but you've taken us through the, uh, the points where the marriage of Western and Indian writers take place in terms of uh, graphic novels. Definitely your focus was highly on certain very, very, uh, some case it said those disturbing elements of uh, partition narratives, which are getting reflected well, also Adivasi narratives, a river of stories that you've said, took us through this uh, exposition of anthropocentrism uh, element of Antav Ghosh, Origin Sen, and Vish, uh, Vishjoki Ghosh. So that's always we look forward to in some books that we've referred to us would keep coming back to you again and again. There's no going uh, away. So thank you so much for being there always with us. And My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for listening. You. Pleasure. So, so from there, I move to our next speaker, as I can see, is the result there. Uh, the speaker that we have now, it's great pleasure and honor uh, that we have an very, very intellectual, stimulating morning sessions. First with Dr. Shulman and then just now on literary retreat or through Drupadi's lecture. Now we move to uh, Mr. Sai Prasad and it gives me a great honor to introduce our final speaker of the first session, Mr. Sai Prasad, who is the unit chief technological officer for um, internet of things and digital engineering at TCS which is based in Bangalore. Uh, Mr. Sai is a bachelor in engineering from Bangalore University and a postgraduate graduate diploma holder from Emeritus Singapore. He has over three decades of experience in working with various technologies in digital engineering and internet of things. So he's also skilled in product development and product management and has built products in different uh, domains of such as life sciences, retail, and manufacturing. So you can see the wide variety of proposition that he offers. So he has filed three patents related to digital twins for logistic, manufacturing, and process industries. And it is a, also a registered patent agent in India. His areas of interest include uh, design thinking and fostering an innovative culture and innovation culture. So today uh, we welcome him to talk on the role of Internet of Things and artificial intelligence in accelerating sustainable development as this is our thing. I welcome you, sir. Please, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, uh, Professor Samnath, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity um, to speak in this uh, uh, seminar of yours. Um, so I will try to, uh, you know, try to thumb down my presentation as much as possible uh, to make it more simplistic to understand. Um, let me just try to share my screen. Uh, just give me a sec. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Awesome. Yes. So uh, I've kind of thumbed down the uh, presentation. Uh, and so in case I go a little bit uh, deep technical words here and there, uh, please pardon me. Uh, I have structured this presentation uh, predominantly around, uh, you know, how AI is accelerating the pace of innovation, AI with IoT, and especially in the area of sustainability. And, and that being a very important topic, uh, what does the future hold for us? Uh, so what I've tried to do is um, kind of give you a couple of uh, understanding about sustainability. I have a couple of slides on, on what, what what we talk about when we say sustainability and what are the innovative areas that you can, uh, you know, kind of conceive uh, in making use cases and solutions for this uh, problem of uh, problem or what you call the, the issue of sustainability. And the second uh, section I would cover uh, one slide on IoT uh, with kind of understand basics of what is IoT and AI uh, and how AI is being looked at or what are the various ways in which you can actually look at from the AI perspective. I'll sum it up with a couple of use cases which I thought would be relevant for you to kind of understand, uh, you know, how it can be applied. And then, you know, uh, finally uh, uh, summarize with what are the challenges that you will face uh, if you're going to solve something in this, in this nature. So that's probably what uh, this presentation is going to be all about. 
so just to talk about uh, sustainability and what it means to us there are two kind of concepts but predominantly around the same thing is we need to understand uh, a concept called net zero and what that net zero is is you know human needs and wants are going up uh, so there is an objective to do something it could be in terms of uh, you know producing food it might be to transport people from point a to point b it might be to transport goods from areas it might be for retailing it might be for healthcare so the human needs uh, keep going up so there is an objective to achieve something and in order to achieve that objective uh, you will be consuming certain resources and essentially what we are trying to do is balance between the two uh, is when you achieve those objectives and you are consuming the resources if you subtract one from the other it needs to be net zero uh, it might not be net zero today but if i am going to say in the in the short future uh, maybe if it is in a 5 year time frame or a 10 year time frame it will eventually get to a net zero or something more productive because already the planet has been overused on many of these aspects and i think to uh, you know get this math uh, true uh, we need to be doing something now so that in a, is a very simplistic equation but then the problem is not the fact that we understand you know everybody understands this net zero to some, some extent the problem lies in understanding what are the parameters that contribute into this net zero and that becomes humongous and there is no one person who knows everything so people talk a lot i mean i just give a few examples people talk a lot on the uh, transportation with evs but nobody actually looks at the uh, the issue when a battery uh, you know is uh, done with its life and how do you kind of get that back to recycle things Uh, nobody is talking about uh, you know they are talking about it but then people realize it after they get into it uh, is for example the lithium mining that is happening and in fact uh, if you have seen um, in in the papers recently as well they are looking at lithium at kashmir and you know how you are going to mess something up so the es- essence is you are trying to bring ev to say that you know coal is bad um, you know oil is bad but then the alternative that you are looking at from an ev perspective also can be bad in maybe a long term because you might be actually moving the problem from uh, one one country or one region to another place uh, where you'll be actually creating unsustainable growth so to understand those parameters is is a very important uh, aspect and most of the industries are struggling and it's not something that everybody knows how to solve this problem so what we believe is uh, that it's like uh, you know we call them as you know kind of spirit of, you know area of influence and area of knowledge that you have Uh, the core most uh, piece that you talk about every enterprise uh, when they are in the business uh, they need to look at sustainable business for the things that they do in terms of what they produce in terms of what they sell in terms of what they what they have to offer it could be a, a manufacturing industry it could be in retail industry it could be in uh, any of those so that first piece what we call a sustainable business is within the enterprise they need to understand all aspects of Uh, sustainability or all parameters that contribute uh, to that equation of net zero that's number one uh, number two is uh, you also need to have an extended side of the story in the sense that you need to not just look at from an enterprise perspective you need to look at something where you are taking something from somebody or giving it to somebody else which is more the supply chain uh, story which is you may be procuring raw materials you may be sending the finished goods somewhere Uh, so things like that which goes little bit beyond your regular four walls where you have control on uh, your your business so you might have to look at the the next level things around the value chain piece uh, the third is actually looking at the cross industry ecosystem and leveraging something for when your business is running how the other businesses are going to get impacted around you uh, which might have a, a further impact just to kind of give you uh, some examples Uh, again we talk about batteries uh, we talk about the ecosystem of charging for example in a city uh, you know things like that so how do they impact uh, also becomes important it's not just a matter of just having electric vehicles uh, on the on the street but you need to have a charging infrastructure so that's going to impact something around what probably you would have looked at only from the the battery or the battery research perspective so that is the uh, you know within the industry uh, but something uh, from a sustainable uh, living perspective and the final one is a regenerative economy where we are looking at cross sector leverage of how somebody else has done something is it possible for you to bring a cross industry view of how do you look at a uh, sustainable business how do you actually uh, collaborate and cooperate to understand all these variables that go back into that equation of uh, net zero so understanding this uh, whole concept 
is extremely important. And we, we strongly believe uh, that uh, there is no single organization who can actually create a sustainable future. And you have to have a complete ecosystem that goes beyond your general line of business. So you need to be looking at uh, what we sometimes call either a life cycle assessment or assess the whole life cycle of you know, how your business comes into being, how it's being run, how, it, how you're going to transfer something to the, the downstream uh, uh, users of your, your products or your offerings. So this is where uh, the whole concept of uh, sustainability comes in. Uh, and if there are any questions you can probably post and maybe I, will, I can answer them. Um, um, as and when, or maybe towards the end as well. Either way is okay. Um, the second aspect of uh, this is to understand circular economy and why understanding this is important is because it can give you um, uh, some kind of insights to relook at what you're actually trying to do. And that can actually open up some of the innovations that you do in your day-to-day -day activities. And for that, we call them as understanding the R's. Uh, so at the heart of your business, if I look at uh, kind of a life cycle of what you typically would do uh, in any of these uh, uh, in industries or companies that you look at, uh, you need to see that what is it that your business is uh, dependent upon. So for example, you're sourcing something. So when you source uh, any material, for example, it could be food that you produce, it could be uh, the packaging that you do, it could be the, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, materials that you use to manufacture uh, some of the goods, uh, like uh, uh, either your cars or your, uh, you know, uh, some of the industrial equipment that you make. So you source certain things for, uh, uh, you know, for different types of materials. So how do you reduce or replace some of them uh, to look at more uh, sustainable alternatives becomes a very key piece. That means what is it that the material you're consuming and are, are there any ways to look at reduction or you know how, do, how can I reduce the thing that I'm actually using in terms of waste or uh, you know maybe some kind of byproducts that I will be creating or, or maybe replacing them. Uh, the second aspect is to actually rethink or design based on what is that end objective you're trying to achieve. Uh, so for example if your objective is to move uh, goods from point A to point B how can I rethink the various ways in which that object can be moved. Uh, just to give you some examples uh, of this particular thing was, for example, you know, you, if you have received parcels uh, or you keep uh, ordering, uh, you know, food online and things like that, and people are coming to deliver, and you, you see that there are five or six deliveries happening to your house at different points of time in a day. Is it possible for you to optimize these kind of things? Because your needs may be different. Or is it possible for him, not, uh, him or her to actually not deliver all the way to your house but is there a place where they can drop off and you can go and pick it up in one shot? So how do you look at different ways to rethink the whole system of how you deliver things or how you actually uh, you know, uh, uh, achieve that end objective or what is it that you're trying to do? So that's uh, the other area. The third one is around uh, your resources or your energy that you spend, uh, where you can look at reinventing some of the concepts. For example, is there an alternate energy that you can use? Uh, or alternative uh, uh, waste that you'll be producing. Or for example, you're consuming water. Uh, is there a way to kind of reinvent uh, the way that you will use uh, maybe not so great quality water? Is there some uh, you know, lower quality water that I can use for some of my uh, equipment or manufacturing and things like that? So how do you look at reinventing your, your processes? And when you make it or when you make those products or when you actually look at the product from a manufacturing perspective, how do you redesign some of those things uh, to look at alternative or cheaper means of manufacturing that particular product uh, and, and maybe reduce the usage of some of the, uh, dispose, um, the some of the consumables that you have. And finally, if you look at the dispose cycle, there are two aspects to it. One is called the reuse piece, means once you're done with using the product or a component or a thing, how do you kind of make use, uh, how do you kind of reuse this uh, rather than discard it or you know probably recycle it? And the second one is the recycling itself, where you're maybe taking those materials and then putting them into another uh, uh, into another asset or something. So you need to look at not just the materials that you consume, uh, that you need to recycle. It could also be like obsolete equipment, for example. So uh, everybody is talking about EV cars today, but nobody is talking about the IC cars, which will get obsoleted in future. What are, what's going to happen to all of those that is going to be out in the market, uh, you know, which is running still on the IC engine. So there's a lot of ways in which you can use these concepts to come out with asking the right questions 
and this can help you innovate on bringing new use cases that we believe uh, you can actually look at from a whole sustainability angle at a broad spectrum. Uh, kind of, you know, if you can internalize these uh, for everything that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, it can give you a bunch of use cases that you can actually question yourself to figure out, hey, is there a better way to do some of these things and still, you know, have a, a sustainable use and, uh, you know, from a, a, a sustainability aspect for your planet. The next part of my uh, section, I'm just going to talk very briefly about the technology elements that come to support the whole concept of the sustainability. So you have, I have talked about the use cases and what are the ways in which you can actually build use cases around sustainability. Then there is the technology aspects where you can innovate as well. And so one of them uh, in that becomes very core uh, is why I've called this uh, for the internet of things. I will again thumb down the slides to make it very, very simple uh, to understand. And it basically, if I were to explain it in a very simple way, it just is the five layers that we talk about. The lowermost layer is what we talk about the devices and the sensors, where we are talking about digitalization of information. There should be some way by which I can get digital data. And the data could come from any source. It could come from your uh, equipment that you're operating. It could come from your cars. It could come from your... Uh, aircrafts, your, your, your railway, uh, you know, your uh, trains or, or your mobile phones, uh, you know, any place where you're actually sensing and getting the data, it becomes a very important piece, what we call the lowermost, the edge part, which is the edge, the device and the sensors. And this gives you the digitalized information by which you can actually start looking at controlling or as well as understanding some of these things. And that sensing part is extremely important. Once you have sensed all this, uh, you need to transport it somewhere. And that's where you need a lot of network and communication. So that's where we talk about, uh, you know, like for example, uh, we are having this conference. Um, uh, you know, there's a camera uh, which is sensing what I, uh, how I look and where I sit. Some uh, microphone which is taking the audio, and then over the network communication, over Wi-Fi, over uh, different kind of networks that are there, we need to transport this data to some central server, right? So that is the second place where you connect and transfer this information. And when you connect, again, there are many challenges. So you can actually look at them. I put it in a very simplistic way, but the challenges start going uh, you know, higher and higher, depending on what is it that you're transporting. Are you transporting videos? Are you transporting a single sensor data that says yes or no? Are you saying that there is, uh, for example, a lot of images uh, that you're actually transporting? So depending on the amount of information you're transporting, depending on how far you need to transport this information, how quickly you need to transport this information, all this falls part in the network and communication area. Eventually, when the data goes, uh, then you have a central place where you're going to store this information. Uh, the one place that everybody talks about is the cloud, uh, where you can actually take all that information from different sensors and then kind of have a cognitive understanding about what is happening. And that's where you probably need a cloud, which is a central place. Or you can do it much closer to uh, sometimes you may not have the luxury of the cloud uh, or you may need uh, sometimes very quick actions to take place. So you might do it on the edge, which means very close to where this equipment is sensing itself. You might need to actually store uh, this information. So that is the, the third layer. The fourth layer is where I will go a little bit more de deep inside my next screen is around where you use AI and analytics to kind of analyze this information and bring some sense into uh, what we call as a cognitive understanding about what is exactly happening. So when you get sensors from different areas and information from multiple sources, how do you correlate all of that and make sense out of it is where AI uh, will kind of help you to gain some of those insights. And finally, you build these applications so you can actually render this to the customer, uh, to your end, end person or end pro, uh, consumer uh, who can actually use and monitor the aspects and then act on it. For example, uh, I'll just give you a few of these examples. If there's an industrial equipment and it's, for example, burning coal, uh, then you can actually figure out that, you know, is this the optimum, most optimum way in which this is uh, this equipment is operating or is there a better way to do some of these, uh, 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 you know, operations? So you might, if so then let's say the analytics layer gives you a different recommendation to say that you need to optimize at this particular area and that you can render it to the end user, then he can take a call, uh, he or she can take a call to actually uh, drive those uh, parameters to that equipment and start uh, optimizing it rather than running it at a uh, you know inefficient mode of things. So there are various ways in which you can actually look at and every layer here 
uh, presents a tremendous opportunity for you to innovate and look at new ways of doing things. It might be new ways of uh, getting digital information. It might be new ways of communicating this digital information in the network layer or new ways of storing this information at different places or uh, new AI or algorithms that you can apply uh, to solve some of these problems. And eventually you can build a very innovative applications around this. So that uh, is a you know very quick summary of what we believe IoT is 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 there and it's available for you to do. Uh, there's a lot of technology out there, um, and many of these is a few years. It's exponential growth uh, from maybe around 2012 to uh, maybe around maybe the last 10 years. I would say uh, we have seen real tremendous growth in the space of Internet of Things. The the next aspect of this uh, is around AI and analytics, uh, where what we're trying to do is you have a physical object or a physical sense that you're get, getting that physical data or the sensors from. And then you have the digital intelligence uh, where you're actually getting this information in a more digital form. How can you actually exponentially, uh, how can you unlock the exponential value of these uh, using AI and analytics? So here um, I would kind of, I mean, there are various ways in which you can classify this AI, but I just wanted to demystify this in a very uh, uh, simplistic form to say that, you know, it's, if it's possible for you to look at it, maybe from the type of learning uh, that how you learn, how AI learns certain things is one way to look at it. Uh, or the other way to look at it is uh, what are the type of algorithms uh, that you can use? Uh, of course, it, don't have to get too confused. I'll probably give you more detail about what I mean by algorithm. The third piece is uh, how do you do the information gathering and processing? And this is also important in terms of, like I said, one is not just getting the data, but once you get the data, you need to do a lot of things with that data. It may or may not have uh, the right information that you have uh, or you need. And how do you actually process it? and eventually render it. And so if you've seen a lot of the, uh, you know, technology around AR, VR, or, you know, and, and uh, you know, whatever extended reality. And these are places where you use those technology kind of put that out into the end users uh, view of things, right? So, sorry. So if I talk about learning, uh, uh, broadly, uh, you can consider this uh, is a very broad sense. Of course, there are many other types of learning. There's one, uh, what we call supervised learning, and the other one is called an unsupervised learning. Essentially in a supervised learning, what you need to do is you need to collect a lot of historical data and tag saying that this is, uh, you know, uh, information A versus information B and so on and so forth. This is a, a very uh, a kind of, um, I mean, you, you, if you know exactly what is happening and that's where you use a supervised learning where you're actually trying to give AI uh, some kind of information to say that um, I understand this this area of uh, I, you know uh, the data is what is the kind of uh, you know uh, uh, I mean what it's exhibiting or what exactly the system is showing. For example, if an equipment is going to fail, for example, I can actually tag that to say that yes, this equipment is going to fail or it has failed, and those are kind of things that you put in a supervised learning. In an unsupervised learning, it is a case where you really don't know anything. You just push in a whole lot of data. And what AI does is tries to weed out certain things and try to extract patterns by itself. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, concept uh, because sometimes uh, uh, just to give you a very simple example is if I feed the unsupervised learning a lot of photographs of cats, dogs, humans, horses, uh, it can actually say that this these uh, you know, set of images belong to cats and these set of images belong to a dog or you know, a horse or a, 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 a human being. It can actually do that by itself. It may not tell you that this is a cat versus a dog unless you, you actually tag it to say that it's a cat or a dog. And that's where sometimes we call that a semi-supervised learning as well. But in the unsupervised learning, essentially what you're trying to do is just get some kind of a pattern. And if you've used uh, any of the uh, type aheads that you do on your mobile, for example, it knows what the next alphabet is, or the word is going to be, uh, is some of the things that it has gleaned from the patterns that it has recognized by itself. Nobody has to told what is the next potential word because in a supervised learning, you need to actually tell what the next word could potentially be in an unsupervised world. You don't see, and it just looks at an English grammar or an English text 
and figures out, figures out what the next alphabet or next word is going to be. Uh, these are very important for us to understand because this is how we actually use a lot of AI to do things which probably would be difficult for humans to execute. The other type of things is the structured or the unstructured kind of data that you get where you have to apply different types of algorithms. Uh, for example, if it is a very structured data, what I mean by structured data is to say, okay, name, age, gender, uh, so on and so forth. It's very, very seamless uh, names or you know, age and things which are very static numbers that you can, uh, for example, age, you can say, give me somebody who is uh, you know, less than 50 years of age and 30 years of age, you can, so you can actually see information in a very structured way and you can start querying that. The unstructured nature of data is uh, things like images, videos, uh, natural language uh, kind of things. And why this is important again is in terms of sometimes, for example, uh, now coming a little bit into the sustainability angle. If you're looking at sustainability and you're looking at images and videos that are coming either from drones, from satellites, from um, uh, you know um, uh, any other camera feed that you get, uh, for uh, maybe to understand how, let us say, a forest uh, fire is happening, or maybe there is a uh, there's a natural calamity of floods, or you know maybe some earthquakes, example, uh, you know these kind of things that you can actually get information from different sources, which may not be as structured as what you will get from the unstructured nature of the data that you get, or it could be a natural language, for example, somebody is going to type something and say that look, there's a disaster here. It might be a free flowing text in somebody or you can say that you know somebody started a forest fire or things like that, which can come in a natural language, but you need to process that information and bring that over um, so that people can act on it quickly. So that's the area from the algorithm perspective. And the third, like I said, uh, a little bit, the data gathering piece uh, might kind of swing somewhere in between IoT and uh, AI. Uh, but in the terms of data gathering, when you get different types of data, like I said, uh, you get, for example, uh, structured data and you get unstructured data, you need to mix uh, or kind of understand some of this. For example, if I get a satellite data that has got a lot of cloud cover, for example, I need to probably remove that. Uh, so some of the data processing part comes into picture where you'll be processing the data once it is all gathered uh, from different sources. And finally, the presentation of that data, like I said, uh, it could be your AR, VR, XR, or it could be on a mobile, or it could be a web-based applications uh, that you can actually drive these kind of things. So that, in a broad nutshell is what uh, AI uh, can also do uh, in, in the area of uh, uh, the technology and the sustainability side, I mean, from a IoT side. Now, uh, before I go to the next part, uh, of my uh, presentation, there are like a couple of uh, use cases that I would like to cover. Are there any questions that uh, you would like me to answer? Sir, uh, hello. Hello, yeah. Sir, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, sir, now just recently uh, uh, there is a news from Kashmir. We have uh, we, we are going to get a, a huge talk of lithium. So, is there any impact on EVs because of that discovery of lithium in Kashmir? Yeah, exactly. That's 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 what I was trying to say in the beginning. I think I kind of made that point earlier. But so essentially, what happens is everybody is now looking for. See, one of the most important problems in sustainability is is rare earth, for example right, uh, rare, rare materials. When you talk about rare earth materials, it's very few and it's there only in certain parts of the world. Now, in order to make a, another part of the world green, you might actually mess up the uh, part from where you're actually extracting rare earths. So, so when you talk about that whole net zero, what we need to say is what is the impact that it will have today and what will be the impact it will have five, 10 years down the road. Now, if I'm going to say that, uh, okay, maybe I'm going to completely mess up the uh, the Himalayas, for example, uh, just because I'm going to get more EV on the earth and you know I will have less of fossil fuels, we need to put those into the equation to see is that really worth the kind of effort that we're going to spend. So these are questions to be asked. Uh, no, I don't have the answers, but all I'm trying to say is uh, rather than running behind uh, lithium ion, are there any other ways to store energy, for example? And there's a lot of research that is happening. Uh, for example, in uh, just to give you a, a few things, 
uh, people are trying to store uh, energy in on stones uh, people are storing energy in sand uh, storing energy in sawdust so things like which you can't think of as natural raw materials to you other than this lithium ion which somebody has invented uh, we need to look at some of those ways to reinvent uh, you know energy storage uh, capacity or capabilities in this space so so that in a nutshell is kind of give you a, a broad perspective uh, i would not specifically talk about this particular case on kashmir but then what i'm trying to say is it's the is the area of the long term peace eventually should become net zero okay thank you sir thanks so i'll move on to a couple of use cases so the thing that keeps coming in my mind every time you know we look at uh, i just picked up uh, smart transportation for example essentially what we are trying to do is transport people a large number of people from uh, point a to point b there are so many ways to look at uh, sustainability and why uh, ai uh, becomes important in this case is for example if you look at india it's like the third largest rail network uh, under one single management and most of the other other places there like different companies that manage um, uh, you know railways and they transport i mean these are kind of slightly older numbers but maybe uh, you it's still valid it's like 23 million passengers and 3 metric tons of goods are being transported on a daily basis and it, it consumes like 18.5 billion units of electricity out of which 16 billion is for running and then the equipment itself is aging and then so is the workforce so the question to be asked is hey if i am able to kind of make a 0.1 or a 0.01% saving on electricity making the engine more efficient or making those uh, engines run um, in, in a better way uh, right or or i am able to detect for example it is running with some faulty bearings <coughs> i am able to detect that or, or you know something or, or, or on the power that it is consuming if i am able to even reduce by a 0.01% it's a huge benefit to the industry to the to the uh, sustainability angle and to um, you know from an overall uh, you know energy efficiency perspective so how do i look at optimization of performance or maybe just for example is there a better way to just uh, schedule the trains uh, in in a in a in a, in a simpler way in terms of how many uh, you know compartments are used and transported shipped reattached Uh, and how the passengers are moving uh, you know there are so many things by which today as a human being it becomes very very difficult for me to put all these parameters and figure out the best possible options right so ai uh, kind of helps you ai in iot with all the data that we get uh, you can look at you know today uh, potential to actually see uh, if, if there is ways to kind of improve the overall performance of uh, smart transportation for example and why this is important uh, especially with india uh, i mean india's needs are extremely growing and i think we need to uh, you know uh, innovate in some of these spaces uh, to actually see what we could do uh, in, in in this area and remember that uh, replacement like i said is not the only option for example if i say that hey remove all the old uh, electric engines and bring a new one uh, yeah maybe in a short term that's probably looking good but what are you going to do with all those obsolete equipment that you're going to uh, be on the yard which is not going to get used uh, can you repurpose them can you recycle them can you look at uh, different ways in which it can be uh, uh, reused so those are things so again coming back to the circular economy that i'm talking about I mean having a overall general sense and looking at some of these examples uh, you can actually see uh, various potentials to or potential or ideas to innovate and and come with use cases uh, which can be solved or at least looked at from a technology perspective uh the second one i had uh, on my list was on agriculture uh, so as you know that more than 50% of indian population uh, is contrib contributing to 17 to 18% of the gdp in agriculture uh and and if you look at uh, if you look at the per hectare yield uh, of rice or uh, wheat for example uh, you you have uh, 2.4 tons and 3 tons uh, per hectare and out of that if you really look at punjab for example you know they they make the maximum uh, and and in terms of not just that uh, there is the other problem is also the uh, amount of food grain that is getting wasted right between 2005 to 2013 uh, this is reported from the ministry of uh, uh, consumer affairs and agriculture 
uh, about 1.95 lakh metric tons of food grain was wasted. So the question to be asked is, uh, hey, uh, is it possible for you to not just, uh, you know, look at from a usage perspective, maybe we are producing more than we need, or it's getting produced in a place which needs, which, you know, which is actually probably where it's not going to get consumed. Is it possible to kind of transport it quickly before it gets, uh, you know, spoiled? Or, or are there any other ways to look at it? How do you prevent uh, pests and uh, uh, crops and animal diseases? And then, you know, how do you have some advanced warning systems or look at some uh, smart ways to, uh, you know, uh, store the food and, and figure out when things are going bad, uh, you know, things like that before it kind of gets transported from point A to point B. So again, you need a lot of IoT, uh, you, need, you might need some sensorization, you might need some analytics to happen. And these are all things that is very hard for a human to compute and 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 build that story. So th this is where we believe, you know, that if you can actually look at some of these uh, innovative ideas uh, to actually see, even if I, for example, if I'm just going to improve the yield by again uh, uh, one percent or a point one percent, is going to create a huge uh, jump in our overall uh, uh, production. Or at the same time, if I stop uh, uh, the food grains from actually uh, being spoiled, uh, I mean, I can again look at uh, 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 you know huge savings for the country. So there's many other things to be looked at, but these are I thought two uh, interesting examples uh, which would be kind of relevant, and you can expand your portfolio into innovating and coming out with new ideas or new areas to solve these kind of problems. I don't have the solutions today, but. Uh, as TCS, we do have something called a digital farming initiative. We do some of these in that in that space, uh, but there's a lot, lot to be done. Like I said in the beginning, uh, there's not one person who knows uh, everything, and we believe that we need to build that with an ecosystem, with partnerships, uh, with academia, and uh, you know, uh, with, with industries, uh, so that we can actually look at uh, how do we solve this uh, or or do better than what we are doing earlier. So that uh, is what I had to present from a use cases uh, perspective. I have one last slide, uh, and then after that, I would stop and you know I can open up for questions. Essentially, uh, what are the challenges? And and you you know if you want to build uh, some of these things, what are the challenges to be looked at uh, from AI and analytics and IoT perspective? Is that there are too many technologies, and understanding this becomes uh, challenging for all of us. Uh, so sometimes the partnerships help. Uh, you need to look at the interoperability of multiple heterogeneous devices and, and information, which are, uh, you know, protocols or, you know, you call, call it the sensor or the data that you get. Uh, there are so many ways in which you can get the uh, information and you probably, uh, you know, understanding their interoperability becomes extremely important. That's number one. Uh, there are a lot of new algorithms that are coming on, uh, on an everyday basis. Uh, I'm not sure how much of you, how many of you have heard of this chat GPT and kind of things like that. So every day there's new algorithms, uh, there's new ways to do things. How do you look at uh, understanding large amount of data, which is disparate, uh, and how do you clean, filter them and start making use of them uh, becomes extremely important. And, and this, there's a lot of advancement in technology. It's going up in leaps and bounds in terms of algorithms, uh, but we need to keep uh, abreast with it and be knowledgeable about what is happening. Uh, the third one is to uh, be abreast with like the networks and communication, the cloud compute uh, aspects of it, or some of the things of extended reality or simulation models. So how do you build a simulation model before something happens? For example, if I'm able to provide some uh, simulation model to the national disaster relief where they can actually go through, um, uh, you know, before a disaster happens, they can kind of figure out, you know, what's the best way do some simulation runs and things like that. So how the technology can help solve some of these problems uh, becomes extremely important. Uh, then the when you do all these things, uh, you, there is a fundamental uh, uh, problem that you might open up, uh, which probably would not have happened earlier, is to look at the safety and the cybersecurity piece. Remember that, you know, if you just go, for example, the banking, you know, a few years ago, uh, so everybody had to go to the bank and you have to put the money by cash and you have to get a check. Uh, if you want to you know withdraw the money and this, everything was happening by a physical presence of somebody going there and actually doing it the problem was that that model was never scalable and then we came with digital money and digital uh, you know upis and things like that but then when you start doing those uh, essentially it opens up 
a lot of things from a cyber security and safety aspects of things. Uh, the same thing, I mean, I just picked up banking, but the same thing happens with any problem that you look at from a sustainability angle. For example, if I'm going to take uh, photographs of, uh, you know, regions of, uh, uh, you know, people gathered and things like that, you will actually open up uh, certain privacy and security concerns, uh, which you need to be really careful of when you're, you know, uh, building some of these solutions. And finally, um, because this area is is niche is uh, is very interesting and i think um, india actually of course uh, really is slow in filing patents and things like that but remember that these are technologies which enable you to kind of file patents and and file unique solutions and and gather the i would say conquer the war on intellectual property or gather more and more of the intellectual property and i think which truly belongs to us but somewhere you know it kind of gets lost uh, in some of the work that we do without paying much attention to this. So patenting and, uh, you know, filing that also becomes extremely important. Uh, so that in a nutshell is what I had to cover. And uh, that's all I had. I'm open for any questions. Yes, sir. thank you so much. You did a wonderful job in terms of bringing it to a very, uh, common man's perspective, so far as these things are concerned. I know being an engineer, how complicated it would be to, uh, that's where I, uh, there lies your forte to bring it to a common sense understanding. Uh, so a few questions we are getting, just uh, uh, one of the, these would be, you know, there's uh, something that is, which is very much in news now, the impact of chat GPT how it is, you know, the CGPT. Uh, and actually it's fighting with Google now. And gradually, it's, to what extent this issue of employment getting uh, affected again and again. So how do you look at these, view this aspect of employment getting adjusted? Yeah, so so actually, if you look at ChatGPT, uh, for example, um, uh, as I'm not sure whether you are aware, but there are two uh, uh, class action suits, uh, both on uh, you know the the DALI, the the Codex, and you know things like that from a um, uh, attribution perspective, and that's uh, that's that's going on. Okay, so there's some some issue about uh, you know from a, a, a suit perspective, but uh, leaving aside that. If I were to just take ChatGPT by itself and the merit uh, by which it stands, essentially what it's trying to do is to take information and and put them together into a, a form or a way in which uh, any other person can consume. And that, that's been uh, very interesting in the fact that it can actually uh, mix and match things. Uh, and, and if you go back to how a human innovates, Right? You, you go back to like a human innovation concept. So typically what we innovate or what we do is we might take an idea from here, some idea from there and put them all together and you get something new. Uh, that's probably what we call that incremental idea. And I'm not talking about the disruptive innovation piece, but more from an incremental innovation. Chat GPT is more or less in that place uh, in terms of how it's able to collate information from different places, make sense out of it and then bring a structure to it and then present it eventually to the customer, to the end user or whoever is asking a question. So it is a technology that we can't do away with. Okay. Uh, the question to be begged is uh, what do we do with that technology and what are the possibilities that are there with us? Um, and, and would it really uh, kind of um, make humans more dumb, I mean, so to speak. Earlier, you would actually, you know, uh, spend time to act, uh, to innovate, to think of, of uh, you know, spending some time, even to write an article, you would need to uh, kind of understand what that article is about, and you need to do a lot of research. But uh, some of these uh, outputs that you're seeing from chat GPT, clearing a bar exam, or, you know, uh, you know, things like that would, would kind of beg to make, would, are we actually going to become, uh, easier uh, I mean, kind of lay back and, and, and fall out of this uh, thing. Uh, that's something to be, that only time will tell. I may not have the answers to it, but just to give you one example, uh, I did, I mean, from my experience perspective, I did uh, work with Japan, uh, you know, some time back and we had a way in which we were actually trying to remove a two-dimensional drawing, an engineering drawing, 
and make that into three dimension. And that became a big debate there. And they questioned the fact that, hey, if I were to look at a two dimensional image, then my mind has all the capabilities to process that into a three dimensional image. And that nature of how human thinks and that, that thinking power of human, you're actually killing it by actually giving them a ready-made 3D pre-cooked stuff, right? So it might happen uh, and, 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 uh, and there was no escape. And eventually uh, just to kind of, how we concluded on this was we gave them a 3D picture uh, pasted on a 2D Excel sheet. Uh, it still didn't remove the, the thing, but you know, it, it kind of gave a certain uh, concept which probably we could have avoided. But I mean, these are questions to be begged, uh, begged to be asked, you know, that you have to really think through. But this, these are kind of things that you will you you can't avoid, uh, and at the same time uh, you have to be fully aware and be on top of things. Hmm. A short, long answer to a very short question. No, uh, and, and I guess uh, a lot of uh, political will as well as again people need to come together. Uh, policy formulation, and all those things are there. So I guess here again, sustainable development goals that are there that need to be kept in mind. Address those essential. But the other question that comes is uh, uh, in terms of artificial intelligence, the identification of fraud, to what extent it's like given the increasing elements of cyber crime. So, uh, to what extent it's gaining ground? How far we are become, becoming immune to frauds? Yeah, so uh, there are two aspects to it. One is the security aspect and then the second one is the privacy aspect. Um, so both of them, uh, you know, like I was trying to say at a very high level, uh, but if I, if you were to roll back a few years into uh, go into any of the manufacturing companies or manufacturing shops uh, or some of the R&D centers, they never had IoT and there was no internet in some of these shops and they were done it with a deliberate intent that nobody downloads things onto a, let us say a machine which is controlling a, a CNC machine which has got its own operating system. There was no way people could download a virus onto it and then mess up things. That's how it was a few years ago, but now it's all open and everybody's trying to push things into the cloud. Now, essentially what that does is it actually adds challenges at every layer of, uh, in terms of the security. And you can have security when data is at rest uh, or when the data is in motion, which means you're actually transmitting something over the network. So there's a lot of research going on uh, on the cybersecurity space and uh, privacy. Uh, for example, is the same thing with cars. Uh, if I were to talk about autonomous cars and connected cars that we talk about today, uh, earlier, you would never, you just had a radio in your car, uh, but if you look at the HMI systems that are there, uh, you, you connect your mobile phone, you can, or maybe there's a map which is already downloaded. So there's a lot of interaction that happens between a car and the outside world, which was not there earlier. Uh, so anybody could hack into things and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, push things down into areas which are very, um, uh, which can actually cause uh, human harm. Uh, so now that security, uh, we are trying to look at from a, from both the aspects or two, three aspects, actually. Uh, one is from the hardware side, uh, where you can actually enable or disable a lot of things from a hard hardware perspective. Uh, the second one is cybersecurity from a software uh, and algorithmic perspective on how do you algorithmically determine that there is a threat for you. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, we have also partnered with the Institute in Australia, where we're looking at quantum key generations, uh, where it basically looks at uh, a key, a crypto key that uh, you know you can use uh, to kind of uh, cut cut away some of these uh, security and vulnerable vulnerabilities that happen. Uh, and the third <clears throat> is in terms of the users themselves, you know, trying to educate them, but which is a very hard problem to solve. Uh, and then the whole other concept of yeah. privacy uh, comes into picture. Uh, for example, uh, you might actually expose a lot of things. Uh, for example, if I have a, a, a camera at a traffic light, uh, and you actually have uh, images of people uh, who are walking around, uh, you might actually use that for not just the the good use, but you can also put it for, for bad use as well. So the, the lot of things that we have to see in terms of how do you protect the data, which is both at rest as well as the data at motion. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So there it goes. And then in terms of, now there are days that people talking about, even in the field as uh, robot, robot and other things are getting utilized, how, uh, uh, in terms of laws, field of law, 
robots will be fighting cases and in the proceedings, court proceedings. So how do you see that? How far it will be workable? Oh, okay. I haven't done much so, research yes. on that topic. So I, I mean, I can only uh, at a bare minimum talk about... Uh, yeah, please. See if it, yeah, if you talk about the uh, uh, robotics piece, uh, we see uh, automation and autonomous operations as the next gradation that is going to happen from a manufacturing perspective. Uh, and and we we and there's uh, in between we are talking about cobots, where there's a collaborative robo, where you know human works along with the robo. Uh, so your robo does something, and the humans uh, uh, kind of augment what is happening. In fact, uh, I did go to one of the factories uh, out in the east, uh, one of the APAC countries, where they have uh, 4,000 employees, or rather 3,100 employees and 4,000 robos, and the robos are making the same robo. I mean, it's like basically making itself. And it comes and stacks it into the. So you might have seen it in movies, but it's actually happening today in the world. Uh, so and they say that uh, they don't go for strikes, and you know you can run the thing in what they call nights out operation. Uh, so many of the uh, things can happen in the night. Uh, there's nobody uh, who's going to stop them from executing, and they do their uh, work. Uh, it's kind of repetitive work in some sense. So robo, uh, you can't do away with, uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, fighting law and things like that, I have not actually done much research. So I probably may not be able to uh, discuss on that particular topic uh, uh, process on that. Okay. And uh, so another question is, uh, is there any specific programming language uh, which is used in, uh, which is gaining get popularity in terms of artificial intelligence? We see yeah, various so, ways uh, yeah, basically it's Python. Uh, most 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 of them are in, in the world of Python. Uh, now again, what you have to be careful about, uh, which you have to really look at, is from what is that? Because Python comes along with a lot of packages as well, uh, and so what is the package that you use to uh, develop on top of Python also becomes important, and uh, you have to look at some of the licensing aspects of uh, Python. A few years ago, we used to use a lot of things on R. R is also a good uh, programming language. Uh, but the problem with R is it's GPL. Uh, I think so you have to kind of open source many of these things. Uh, so depending on whether you are using it for your own use or for somebody uh, else, uh, you can actually look at Python. Uh, then there are uh, other data analytics tools which are out there in the market, uh, like SAS, GMP, and things like that, which, you can, which are commercial tools that you can use to kind of do some of the uh, industrial AI probability and statistic studies and things like that. Yeah, fine. Uh, there's another question that has uh, come up. Uh, the, what are the possible effects for recent lithium discovery uh, in Argentina on sustainable development? Your remarks. Yeah, I think I kind of, uh, it will be a repeat of what I said yeah, last time. Kash but like I said, so yeah, like, touched upon yeah, Kashmir yeah so the thing was uh, i think somebody was saying that uh, you know europe will become green and lithium i mean whatever argentina would become uh, you know brown or you know whatever <laughs> slushy uh, with all that lithium that is gone away from the country so we yeah. need to look at you know who whom we are supporting and which part of which region will become uh, this thing green that's that's the issue but but just to kind of give you another interesting aspect uh, there's a lot of things that people are doing on space robotics and space mining. Uh, so there's research going on in that, that area uh, where people are trying to extract uh, such kind of rare earth from asteroids. And uh, so it's not, so they just kind of looked at landing on asteroids and pulling out things from there. Uh, very early stage research, but uh, something that people to be looked at. Okay. So this is where I think uh, we have done with a few questions that we got. So, Thank you so much. And I would also thank our co-sponsors of the event, uh, Vara Builders and CPLC uh, Management Studies, uh, which have been through us, have been supporting our group. I also take the opportunity now to invite our uh, uh, Vice Principal and IQC Coordinator, Srimati Chandana Chakravarti, to propose a formal vote of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. Hello, everybody. Yes. Good, good afternoon. And uh, we have had a 
very interesting session today under our topic on contemporary trends in humanities, commerce, and basic and applied sciences and charting sustainable development. It is indeed a great honor which has been conferred on me to propose a formal vote of thanks for this session that we have had. And I begin with our speakers for the day. Uh, our first speaker, the keynote speaker that we had, Dr. Peter Schulman. He has talked on the topic of sustainable development. And it was wonderful to hear his views on Jules Verne's concerns and the dystopian novels, where he has talked on the talks of convulsions of nature and 20,000 leagues under the sea, which is a prophetic and futuristic work. His sensitive portrayal of connecting the contemporary times through the upheaval of the environment which is happening in Congo region was also very disheartening. You know, it was the environmental destruction which is taking place here also brought to light the capitalist forces which are in work. He has also not only talked about uh, the, the problems, but he has also given a positive note to his entire uh, entire session that he had. And he has talked about the vital role which citizens can play and which, uh, you know, community can, can play. And he has talked about the community groups of Canada, Haiti, and their attempts of reforestation. So thank you, Dr. Peter Schulman, for sharing your ideas and your views. Our second speaker for the day was Dr. Dhrupadi Chattopadhyay. Listening to her was really a very, very uh, enthralling experience. It was more of an intellectual, visual, and a literary treat that we had the good fortune of experiencing today. She has taken us through her uh, ex exploratory aspects of graphic novels. And I, being a non-literature person, this was the first exposure that I had of how you can interpret graphic and uh, the different ways in which she could uh, elaborate on how you can interpret a particular picture or a graphic representation. She has uh, also uh, been uh, very informative about the new areas of research, which is possible in this area. And I'm sure our students who are attending this conference are going to benefit from it, ma'am. She has focused on Indian uh, fiction and eco-criticism and has blended the Western and the Eastern writers through works of Amita Ghosh, Orijit Sain, Vishwajit Jyoti Ghosh, and so on. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your very, very enchanting uh, session that we have had. Now, today we have actually brought the academia and the industry together by having the third speaker, Mr. Sai Prasad, amongst us. Thank you, sir. Your topic was very highly technical, but as Somnath has already said, you have tried to make it as lucid as you could, uh, although a lot of it still is beyond our understanding. But then it is a topic which itself is a technical topic. But you have highlighted on how technology and development and environmental care should be, there should be a balance between them. This is what you have highlighted on. And you have also stressed on innovative thinking, which I think is what is needed in today's time. You have talked about demystifying IoT and also on digital farming and how food production can be improved with the use of technology, how food wastages can be minimized or avoided. And you have also talked about your challenges which are there by, in using AI-based solutions. 
so your entire session was an eye opener sir and thank you for sparing your valuable time and being amongst us to move on i also would want to thank our governing body of palatilak vidyalaya association which is more than 100 years old organization working in the field of education they are always there as a backbone behind us encouraging us to take up various activities which can uh, enhance our knowledge which can enhance students uh, uh, knowledge also and uh, this conference has provided a platform for researchers academicians students and practitioners and industry people to reflect on research and discuss on innovative problem solving practices to achieve the sustainable development goals to move on i would fail in my duty if i wouldn't acknowledge the massive work the tedious work which has been done by my colleagues of this institution it is tireless and i think sometimes thankless job which they have done because they have been working for a very long time and coordinating with the various speakers coordinating with the uh, students the teachers the paper presenters and so on so i wish to put on record my uh, acknowledge uh, my thanks to the organizing team and just to name them somnath deshmukhia sachin joshi mansi moe rakesh pise suraj raut shuddhodan athavle swapnil shenvi aniket prabhuvalkar and archana tarekar thank you thank you for being such a wonderful team and the way you have organized this conference last but most important i would like to thank all the participants both the accommodations as well as the students without whom the entire exercise would have been futile just to put on record we have had an overwhelming response of more than 83 papers if i am wrong please correct me somna more than 83 papers for publication 120 accommodation as participants and more than 100 students who have participated in today's conference so i feel that basically this conference has been a, a universal call to initiate actions towards sustainable development to end poverty protect the planet and ensure that by 2030 everyone enjoys health peace and prosperity this conference has been uh, has has tried to give a platform to many uh, people who are interested including students who are interested in taking up research work and therefore i thank everyone concerned with this conference thank you very much over to you somnath thank you thank you immensely all your inputs for being through this guiding us mentoring us whenever repeated number of visits that we have made to you with all our small little idiotic questions that we had thanks 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 immensely and uh, now again once again i extend my Uh, gratitude to all the speakers, uh, Mr. Including Mr. Sai Prasad, who is there with us now, and the program that uh, was I must mention that the program was co-sponsored by uh, the Nivara Builders and CPLC. Thank you. We will be joining back in about twenty uh, minutes. I request uh, a link will be shared soon, and I request you all to join in about. 20 minutes or so thank you thank you so much.